Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Troy. Yeah, like the school teacher. <laughs> well, this will be an interesting uh, experiment. Hopefully, everything, the technology plays nice. I'll call this a uh, meeting to order. We're going to start with O Canada, please. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. So for the viewing uh, public, I would point out we're about half and half, right? One, two, three, four, about half and half. Maybe a little bit more than half uh, um, physically present and the others uh, joining us virtually. Um, so Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Mackey. Present. Councillor Gamble. Present. Councillor Burley. Present. Councillor Carlton. Present. Councillor McQueen. Here. Councillor Desai. Present. Councillor Patterson. Present. Gordon Hicks. Here. Councillor Clumpus. Present. Councillor Keaveny. Present. Councillor Body. Present. Councillor O'Leary. Councillor Woodbury. Councillor Millen. Councillor Soever. Councillor Bordignol. Present. Councillor Robinson. Present. Councillor Hutchinson. Present. As the warden indicated, we have uh, councillors Carlton, McQueen, Columbus, Body, Bordignol, Robinson, and Hutchinson participating virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move next to the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot's people on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors sign treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and the Inuit whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all, as treaty people, live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Okay, moving on to item number six, adoption of minutes, starting first of all with the uh, County Council and Committee of the Whole Minutes, which are dated February 10th. I'm going to say that that's moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by what I have there. Oh, Councillor Mill. Any discussion on those uh, minutes? And seeing none, I'll call the question. Is there anyone opposed? We, we can do all in favor. Okay. So, all in favor, please uh, raise your hand. See everyone's hand raised, thank you. That is carried, thank you very much. So we're on to item 6B, uh, the minutes of a public meeting dated February 3rd, dealing with the official plan amendment 11. Uh, moved by Councillor Burley, seconded by Councillor Patterson. 
Any discussion on those uh, minutes? I do not see any, therefore I'll call the question. All those in favor? Is there anyone opposed? I'm seeing, no. Sorry, so all those in favor again. Okay, everyone online is indicated in favor. Everyone in the room in favor. Uh, so no one being opposed, that is carried. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have no closed meeting matters. Uh, so we're on to item number eight. 8A is the Board of Health uh, uh, minutes, which are dated December 17th. I believe, oh, we need a mover to um, get it going. Uh, moved by Councillor Milne, seconded by Councillor Woodbury. Um, Dr. Era, I believe, is with us. Good morning, sir. You have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Ward, and good morning, Council. Thank you for having me. The uh, highlight from uh, the past two meetings uh, were the review of uh, board policies uh, as per the board policy. One of the policies require a review every two years that was completed in December. The election of uh, the um, uh, board chair and vice chair in the first meeting in, in 2022, which took place in February instead of January. Um, Mayor Sue Patterson was uh, elected as uh, chair. Uh, Mr. Alan Barfoot was uh, elected as vice chair. The um, other highlight from operations, um, the, the first uh, item, uh, of course, uh, COVID and uh, the surge related to Omicron and uh, multiple uh, events uh, have taken place since uh, those minutes, but in, in general, the uh, trajectory of the indicators locally have been uh, trending in a positive direction, as well as uh, provincially, as, um, <clears throat> whether it is the number of new cases or the number of hospitalization, number of outbreaks in long-term care, uh, and the complexity of them, all these indicators would would suggest that we are heading in the right direction to uh, hopefully lifting emergency um, declaration over in, in the near future. And of course, that will be a decision uh, provincially and locally uh, through municipalities and councils. Um, the uh, vaccine front, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the last uh, uh, update, uh, we, we have uh, the capacity and we have delivered, uh, provided access to third dose to the all eligible population uh, within two weeks, which is track record, allowed us to have a high level of third dose around 60% at this point. And um, we continue to provide targeted clinics in lower coverage areas through working with the community uh, centers, working with the municipalities. We mapped out also the possible next. The uptake uh, was, was not uh, uh, large enough to actually to justify opening clinics, but we have worked with these families uh, that uh, want the vaccine to direct them to the local pharmacies and support the local pharmacies and primary care as well. Uh, the other final item uh, from uh, the uh, previous minutes and it's related to recovery moving from a pandemic to hopefully at this point, at some point in the near future, endemic is the recovery and backlog in uh, public health services. Uh, one of the presentation in, uh, in the last meeting was about the dental programs, uh, the oral health programs, whether it's in school screening, the uh, free dental services for eligible low income children and eligible low income seniors. Uh, the health, it's worth mentioning the health unit, uh, our health unit has been one of the very few health units that continue to provide the service during the pandemic. It, it was not an easy decision, but uh, the unwavering commitment for our staff and managers allowed us to, to do that. And uh, that backlog, uh, th there is always a backlog, whether it's with vaccine, other vaccine in schools or dental or, or other services. So uh, going forward, we have the plan and the a commitment to ramp up the recovery to address those health needs in the community. Um, one, one final point on that recovery is the uh, mental health and addiction uh, um, need or, or uh, services that uh, are required to be ramped up and, and uh, um, augmented through work with different partners and uh, 
uh, I, I want to thank the council and the county for taking the leadership on that file as well. That's my update, Mr. Chair. Open to questions as always. Thank you very much, Dr. Aaron. Are there any questions from council for Dr. Aaron? I don't see anyone online. I don't see anyone in the room. <clears throat> Councilor Patterson, is there anything you wanted to add? Thank you, Warden Hicks, and good morning, County Council. Just one item. Uh, during that December meeting, the board received a presentation from Ian Reich, uh, public health manager. The topic was foundational standards, and he spoke about population health assessment, health equity, effective public health practice, and emergent, emergency management. So each of these standards are treated as a project developed as a goal and will ultimately achieve our mission to promote health and prevent disease. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Any questions coming out of that? Seeing no hands, seeing no one online, and perhaps it's time to call the question. Uh, I'll Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Councillor Desai. Thank you, I was a little late raising my hand. Uh, my question to you, Warden Hanks, to Dr. Ayer is, um, we know we're moving into uh, the reopening per se, starting March 1st. Um, the vaccine, um, not issue, but the proof of vaccination is going to become voluntary for various businesses. Um, do we, have a timeline at all for uh, things such as the mask mandates and uh, reopening completely in the sense of when we will be able to gather uh, without any limitations on numbers and so on in, in all venues, because obviously on March 1st, uh, venues that require, or there are certain venues on March 1st that can be reopened in full, but there are certain that still can't. So do we have a date or an indication of when that date could be coming? Thank you. Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the question. The, the uh, underlying principle in the management of a pandemic by public health is to lift restrictions as soon as possible, so long it is safe. And I have uh, seen that the, uh, from my point of view, the provincial plan for lifting restrictions gradually and, and the next step on, on March first to uh, lift uh, multiple restrictions is quite measured. Uh, lifting the uh, requirement for vaccine is, is one of them. Locally, um, th there will be communication with local businesses about the recommendation about the vaccine policy. It, it should come out uh, from my office in the near, in the imminent future. And, and it, it will reflect uh, the support of, of that uh, provincial lifting of restrictions. We, we do stand in a, in a good position to lift the restrictions as soon as the province uh, allows us to do so. It's very difficult to predict what the province um, will be issuing next. Uh, I can see the mask use to be continued in the near future for, for a period of time. Uh, passive screening for symptoms uh, at businesses. Those are least intrusive and, and uh, um, that they carry a significant or, or carry sufficient weight to, to protect uh, from further uh, uh, complications in the management of the pandemic. But in general, uh, all these restrictions should be lifted as soon as, as there is no need for them. Uh, again, I apologize, my answer is, does not have dates associated with them, but I can uh, reassure the council and the public that uh, we are in very good standing to, to be ready to lift restrictions as soon as we get the green light from the province. Anything further? Is there anyone else? One once, twice? Okay, it's time to call the question on the uh, motion to receive uh, these uh, minutes dated December 17th. Is there all those in favor, sorry? In the room, everyone approved. Uh, oh, sorry. And online, thank you. Is there anyone opposed? That is carried. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have no bylaws. Uh, we're on to item number 10 now, good news and celebrations. Uh, 
I see no hands at all. Oh, I see one hand, uh, Councillor Clumpus. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, being it a sunny day, there's got to be positive news happening here this morning, and I uh, just wanted to comment that it seems to be the season for public engagement opportunities. And uh, last night we had a very robust um, opportunity to engage with uh, the public. We had over 70 participants in our official plan review um, uh, public engagement. and. Uh, um, this was um, led in partial by a, a group of um, master's students from the soon to have a name change Ryerson University, who will be participating in this exercise all through the piece. And in uh, the subsequent 20 or more uh, public engagement opportunities that are planned, uh, it's great to see public en engagement. It's great to see our, the students involved and to the, uh, they bring a different dynamic to uh, to uh, any of the proceedings and it was really a very robust uh, discussion and it's also in uh, tandem with a uh, Meaford Hall st uh, strat plan that is occurring at the same time so um, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, considerable attention being paid to that as well good news for us thank you thank you very much for that anyone else See no one else, we will move on. Um, looking for a motion to adjourn now. Trying to find someone online so I can include you folks. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Carlton and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Okay, so we are, oh, sorry, all those in favor? <laughs> no one being opposed, that is carried, thank you. Just take a second and switch over to <clears throat> Committee of the Whole. That's good. All right, thank you. I'll call this meeting uh, to order. This is uh, February 24th. We're now meeting as Committee of the Whole. Uh, is there, Council, is there any declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? Seeing none, I would just indicate if one does arise during the course of the meeting, I would ask you to declare it at that time. Um, our delegates are scheduled, our first delegate is scheduled for 10.30. So that's it, we'll move on with perhaps the, um, uh, some other items in the agenda. Um, we'll look at the consent agenda if we shall, if we can, please. Is there anything there that requires a uh, separate discussion? Uh, Councillor Bordignon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, through you. Um, CTRCW0722. Tender results were greater than 13. Which one is that now? Item C. C. Okay. Yes, thank you. So 5C. I don't see any other hands. So if that's the case, then I'm going to ask for uh, a mover to approve the uh, consent agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Keaveney, seconded by. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? No one being opposed. That too is carried. Just give me one quick second here, Madam Clerk. What are your thoughts? Do you want to deal with the six A? Yeah. Six A policy then. Right. Yeah, so you know, she's ready. Seven B. Uh, Council, uh, with with your leave, I would like to perhaps uh, suggest that we go straight to item 7D, uh, uh, excuse me, 60, my apologies, 60, which is the year-end uh, transfers. We're trying to see if, is it Mary Lou or Sue? Uh, Sue, okay. We're trying to see if we can get Sue to come in. So we'll just take a brief second.
<laughs> okay, I'm started. Okay, we're, we're being recorded, so I would just ask everyone to bear with us. We're going to have a presenter. He started it. Yes, <laughs> you're probably surprised that we're <laughs> ready to deal with you. We've moved your item up, uh, Sue, so take your time. <clears throat> yeah, we should put the item on the uh, floor though, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we're now dealing with item uh, 6D, the year-end transfers. I need a mover to put the item on the uh, floor. Uh, moved by Councillor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Hutchison. And Sue, you have the floor. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. The uh, report before you is to provide Council with the estimated year end surplus deficit amounts per functional era and to pro provide staff with the authority to make adjustments necessary to finalize the county's 2021 year end financials for the following. One, the year-end surplus and deficit transfers. Two, year-end transfers for purchases that were budgeted to occur in 2021 and need to be carried forward to 2022. And the year-end transfers for donations received for specific purposes. Under the year-end surplus and deficit transfers, you will find in the first chart of the report, this chart identifies surplus and or deficit amounts and recommendations on how to allocate these. Staff have reviewed year-to-date actuals as of mid-February and are estimating an overall surplus of $363,100 for the year ending December 31st, 2021. The departmental breakdown of this surplus is contained in the first chart of the report. I will not go over these line by line, but overall there is an estimated $175,800 to be withdrawn from the one-time funding reserve with the remaining transfer to and from specific departmental reserves. Within the year end transfers for purchases that were budgeted to occur in 2021 and need to be carried forward to 2022. In the second chart within the document, you will find both projects that were budgeted or endorsed to occur in 2021, but due to various factors have been delayed. The county's auditors require a council resolution authorizing staff to transfer unspent funds to reserve for use in the 2022 budget. Some of these projects have been rebudgeted in 2022 to be funded from reserves, and this report will allow staff the authority to transfer the tax levy in 2021 raised into a reserve mentioned within the chart. These projects are reflected in column four of the chart. There are also some projects that were expected to be complete in 2021 at the time of budget development, and therefore were not included in the 2022 budget. These projects are reflected in the fifth column. Of these projects, there are two larger projects that were not included in the 2022 budget, and these are the Grey Roots General Store and the fire alarm project at Lee Manor. And thirdly, the year in transfers for donations for, for specific purposes. During the year, the county receives donations for specific purposes and any donations not spent on these need to be transferred at year end to a reserve to be utilized in the future for these specific purposes. In the last chart in the report, you will find a list of donations by departmental area that were donated for, to for a total of $13,238. And that's the end of my report, and I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Sue. Are there any questions? The council? I do not see any. So with that said, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion? Everyone in the room and everyone online has indicated, and no one being opposed, that is carried. Thank you very much, Sue. Okay, so we're getting closer to that uh, time for the delegation. Are the delegates joining us by um, remote or they not there remote? They are remote. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Mm 
The movie will start shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we are, I, I believe that we do have our, our guests uh, ready. Rob, can you confirm that? I don't, they are ready? Okay, perfect. So we're going to have our first uh, delegation. Um, who's introducing them? Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Come on up. Thank you, Mr. Rodin, and good morning, County Council. I'm um, really excited to be here this morning just to share the completion of the age-friendly community strategy and action plan. Um, this morning, I see Nadia's face just on the screen. We have Nadia DeSanti. She's coming and joining us today from Ottawa, and she works as a project lead for WSP Consulting. Um, so she'll be giving us a bit of a capstone of what we've completed to date, and then I'll follow up with some additional information following her presentation. Thanks. Very much, Nadia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And good morning, Mr. Warren and members of uh, committee. Um, I am very excited to uh, be here today uh, to present the um, and talk about the Gray County Age Friendly Strategy. So my name is Nadia DeSanti. I am a registered professional planner and I was the project manager for the um, county's age friendly community strategy and action plan, which we have been working on since May 2021. The project was primarily funded by the government of Ontario. We worked with the county to select representatives for a stakeholder committee, and I want to acknowledge uh, those uh, those individuals and organizations um, from key organizations and agencies who um, had a significant interest or level of involvement in implementing um, and developing the action plan. And I'd like to just mention a few. They will all of the organizations are listed in the action plan. Um, but they have been really instrumental in providing that, you know, ears to the ground, that local input. And so we've learned a lot from them and their energy and passion is, was clearly demonstrated through the meetings and emails that we've had. So just to name a few, some of the stakeholder committee members included representatives from the Gray Bruce Local Immigration Partnership, the Alzheimer's Society of Gray Bruce, Gray Bruce Council on Aging, Gray County Joint Accessibility Committee, the YMCA of Owen Sound Gray Bruce, Georgian College, and many other local organizations and agencies. This project was completed in four steps over two phases, and it is it was based on the province of Ontario's age-friendly community guide for municipalities and community organizations. And this guide was released in 2021. So it was an update uh, that, that was released. And in phase one of the project, we completed the um, phase one, sorry, phase one started in May and completed uh, was completed in September. And it resulted in the age-friendly community strategy. And the two steps that went into that formation of the strategy was to really define the age-friendly vision and principles for Gray County. So um, you will see that vision statement. We always went back and checked it throughout the process to make sure that it was still valid. We also carried out a community needs assessment and that included site visits to various locations, an extensive survey online and all of that um, fed into the Gray County age-friendly community strategy. So that's a separate document. Then phase two started in October and is being completed um, uh, next month when the uh, action plan goes to council. Um, but it's completed from a WSP perspective, the implementation of that plan um, and is really important and I'll get into that a little bit in this um, presentation. And so um, step three is really having council endorse that plan next month and then implementing the action plan, reevaluating the steps and actions in that plan and, and ensuring that it's a living document. 
engagement was a key priority for this project. And we um, and our colleagues and um, Stephanie and county staff engaged with a variety of key stakeholders, including um, county staff from other departments, as well as lower tier municipal staff, agencies, community and Indigenous groups, and members of the public throughout uh, the two phases of the project. We used a number of engagement methods to consult with all of these groups, and that included active engagement through virtual workshops, uh, interviews, focus groups. Um, we even had participants join by the phone, uh, which was really nice and kind of um, nice to hear someone on the phone, uh, which is, I think, something that we um, um, you know, tend to sometimes forget, right? We're always on our digital phones, but uh, it was nice to hear somebody uh, and people participating by the phone. And also passive engagement, including through our project website, our online surveys and word of mouth. We developed a background review report in 2021, and that is available on the project website. And that summarizes the county's existing policy framework. And it also highlighted some gaps um, and then those gaps are, are what we, you know, stem from to help with developing action items. So that's just kind of one, one, um, one source of information. And then we also developed an engagement findings report that summarized all of the input that we did through phases one. So all of the um, community outreach, the online survey, um, all of that was uh, documented in, um, in that report. And then we also prepared a separate H-Friendly Community Strategy. Again, that is available on the project website. And that is based on the technical work completed to, um, and the feedback that we had received from all of the engagement um, opportunities that uh, we held. We also developed the Gray County H Friendly Strategy video presentation, and that summarized the key aspects of the strategy, and it provided more information to the community. So at the end of phase two, we, we do have uh, the Gray County H Friendly Community Action Plan, and it has been circulated to county staff for review. And um, I'm going to speak to that just a little bit more in, in about one more minute. Um, I wanted to just kind of, if you haven't seen the strategy document or if you are interested in sort of diving deeper into that, I just wanted to um, let you all know that that strategy document really set the foundation for the action plan because it highlighted the, uh, as I mentioned, the vision, the goals for Gray County to become a more friend, a more age friendly community. It built upon the background review report. So those gaps that I mentioned, we brought those in and it also identified the strengths. So what are the good things that are happening in Gray County? Um, and what are the areas that need to be improved? And those improvements are essentially the actions that are in the action plan. The action plan is prepared and organized in eight tables, and the eight refers to the community dimensions. Those community dimensions were established by the World Health Organization many years ago, and those eight dimensions include outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, community support and health services, communication and information, civic participation and employment, respect and social inclusion, social participate, pardon me, social participation and housing. So within each of those eight dimensions, we have developed action items. And so when you look at the action plan, you will see the actions and the priorities under each of those eight community dimensions to help address opportunities for improvement. It also acknowledges 
the leads and partners. Gray County cannot implement this plan on its own. And there are many opportunities for other leads to take that initiative and run with it. There could be other um, partnerships that need to work together to, to uh, help deliver. Um, and the action plan also identifies timing, so short, medium term, and performance indicators. And we've also included a process for monitoring and evaluating the actions going forward. So just like, um, you know, annual reporting on budget, annual reporting on building permits, approvals, that kind of thing, the action plan is also meant to sort of have an annual report card. And we've included an example of how that monitoring or that report card could be developed to check and see how are we doing? How um, has this action started? Um, is the time frame still right? So we've provided those tools in the action plan. Um, in addition, um, in each of the tables, we've also provided examples and resources. So those are um, items such as, you know, community grants, um, accessible signage examples, um, you know, also acknowledging Gray County's existing 211 service. And there's other examples that we've, we've pulled in there as, as resource material. So again, the actions help to address the areas for improvement that were identified in the 2021 strategy document and considered additional input from the key stakeholders, community members, county staff, et cetera. And really the action plan is meant to be looked at as a roadmap for the county to work towards becoming a more age-friendly community. And it provides a framework that the county can use to apply for funding and maybe allocate funding to support some of those action items that are identified in the action plan. And I just wanna highlight two of the key recommendations that are identified in the action plan. And that is hiring a dedicated staff person who can focus on implementation of the age-friendly action plan who can take it and sort of steer the ship with that. And that is really key in ensuring that the plan um, is top of mind, always you know, check back in, in terms of other projects or studies um, and other, other discussions with other um, organizations that uh, are to be held in the future. And then the second key recommendation is applying for and receiving the age-friendly community designation through the World Health Organization. Many communities that I've worked in uh, leading age-friendly community plans see the World Health Organization designation as many benefits, including from an economic development perspective, from a, um, from a tourism perspective, from a uh, place to come and live and raise your family and work. Um, the application process from the last time I looked at, looked at it online is not that onerous. Um, and there are, again, a lot of benefits for having that. So those are the, those are the two key um, recommendations that are identified in the action plan. Um, we are really excited about the um, outcomes of this project. I can talk about age-friendly forever. <laughs> um, and as a professional um, you know, planner, it really brings all of that social infrastructure and that hard infrastructure together to really be looking at a community from an a and with an age-friendly lens. And um, I, I look forward to seeing the results and, and hearing about the news uh, and things that will get implemented. Um, and so that is it in a nutshell, but I am happy to answer any questions. And I thank you for the opportunity to present this to you today. Thank you very much for that, Nadia. Uh, Councillor, are there any questions? I do not see any questions. 
but a lot of uh, very good work, um, I know. And uh, the engagement was uh, was incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, uh, I had an opportunity to participate in some of that engagement. It was really, really well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think it's time. Oh, wait, there's nothing to. Right. So we'll come back to that. Are we going to deal with the second delegation? Uh, Oh, okay, so maybe we'll go straight into Stephanie's uh, report. Maybe that's appropriate. Nadia, we're going to be dealing with Stephanie's report now. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Our CAO would like to make a comment. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And I just wanted to acknowledge. Um, Nadia and Randy and Stephanie and everybody that participated in this project. When we started into this, we didn't anticipate that COVID was going, going to be on our doorstep. And so I think you can all appreciate trying to do um, really robust public engagement under these circumstances has been less than optimal. And I really wanna thank everybody who's involved in this for uh, persevering and keeping it going and doing a great job in finding innovative ways to have conversations with people and to understand. I think one of the things that I took away from this report was that we are doing a lot of really good things. You all know it, you're here, that there's a lot of things to really appreciate and celebrate about our communities. And I took it as a, as a lens that as our communities grow and change, this can provide us with some uh, reflections on the things that we want to make sure that we always maintain. The public has told us what's so important to them about our communities, and so I hope that we can use this as a learning tool for that as much as providing some advice and guidance about things that we might want to look differently at. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Turn my mic on here. So we're now going to be dealing with item uh, 6A, right? The Age Friendly Community Project Final Report. It puts uh, Stephanie on deck. I need a mover, actually moved by Councillor Robinson. And I'm looking for a seconder, please. Uh, seconded by Councillor Bordignon. Stephanie, you now have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and hello again, County Council. Um, Tara, can you help with, oh, there it is. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so yeah, not liking to repeat what Nadia has just shared, I'm just hoping to add some additional thoughts and um, information for everyone's benefit. Um, so it is, sorry, I haven't, been, I haven't been in person in a while, so I'm gonna take out my mask, it's a bit comfortable here. Um, so, the following here is just addendum to PDR CW 1421, and it's to, to discuss and, and share the final findings of the age friendly community strategy and action plan. Um, again, I just want to reiterate um, appreciation for all those involved uh, that helped with the creation of these works. Uh, Nadia and her team, so we had Justin Lamond, or sorry, Will Lamond, Justin Jones, Erica Stone, they did a tremendous job keeping these works on schedule um, and achieving the required milestones as per the grant that we received from the province. Uh, they were a pleasure to work with, which is great. Um, and so I just wanna thank you. I also wanna extend thank you to the stakeholder committee members, um, as well as staff from the Wicodong, Grey Bruce Poverty Task Force, Agricultural Advisory and Economic Development Advisory Groups, Grey Bruce Council on Aging, Launchpad, Gray County Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, we had a, a consultation with JDSS grade nine class, Gray County staff, counselors, and members of the public. Your enthusiasm to participate in it and ideas, the ideas shared were extremely helpful and served to set the foundation of the action plan. I also wanted to thank the province for um, the funding received to complete this project. So the following here, we have the project vision statement. Um, so the vision statement was created through feedback from the stakeholder groups, as well as members of the public. Uh, from the beginning of stages of this project, 
we really wanted to iterate that uh, the, the age-friendly lens needs to extend beyond the conventional age-friendly lens, um, such that it's not solely looking at uh, older adults and those with disabilities, but we're really capturing the perspective of all ages. So the, the vision here that was created is Gray County and its communities will create inclusive opportunities for people of all ages to actively participate in all stages of life and to thrive physically and economically with dignity and independence. So we have some demographics in gray that most around the, the table here are probably familiar with. More recently in 2021, uh, Gray County's medium age is 49.3, whereas province-wide it's 40.7. And 24% 24, 24 of Gray's population is 65 years or over, or over compared to only 14.8% age zero to 14 years of age. So what we know is that Gray County continues to be an attractive place for retirees to settle as more as it's a, a people can come here for a more relaxed lifestyle. Um, it's also in proximity to recreational health services and other essential amenities. Furthermore, as Gray County's population continues to age, we are far from achieving population replacement rates. So therefore, supporting young families is a vital component to encouraging the continuation of a vibrant community. In any society, the measure of health and well being of a collective can only be best understood from how the most vulnerable are treated. Arguably, there's a significant number of vulnerable residents in Gray County, inclusive of those beyond the two listed age demographics here. Why is this work important in Gray? Some of the examples and opportunities identified. Um, through the Community Wellbeing Survey in 2018. Um, so their, their recognition, again, to, to resonate what Kim had mentioned, um, the county is doing a lot of great work with respect to age-friendly community planning. Um, so there are high rates of satisfaction from those living in Gray with their personal relationships, access to parks and rec opportunities, and environmental quality of their neighborhood. Through the survey completed with this project, we had around 200 respondents, which is great. Um, and some of the opportunities identified, so we had a, a scale of always, often, sometimes, and never. So just to give you an example, um, one in three survey respondents identified a physical condition or mental health condition or health problem reducing the amount or kind of activity they can do. Roughly one in two indicated only sometimes there are enough benches and rest spots along streets, parks, and buildings. Over one in two indicated that people only sometimes understand how to share the road with other road users, so pedestrians, cyclists, farm equipment, etc. Other opportunities identified through the survey, uh, I did just again, just a really brief list here, a need for a full range of housing choices, culturally sensitive and welcoming activities and attractions, understanding the needs of all ages, so youth, working age, older adults, access to public computers and internet, improved access to family physicians. So just wanted to acknowledge that there is a missed opportunity cost for the community if you're not working toward improving the overall quality of life of all those living here. This requires continued leadership by government and community members working together to ensure policies, programs, and services are inclusive to support social and physical environments designed for people to remain in their community and participate in community life. So Nadia did bring up in her presentation that we created the a really extensive action plan. Um, we have 116 action items in that action plan. And as she mentioned, it's divided up based on the eight age-friendly domains as defined by the World Health Organization. So I've just provided an example of one of the 116 action items of that action plan, just for your reference. Um, and so here we have an action item that is speaking to accessible construction, renovation and retrofit program. And then we've identified the timing, action lead, potential partnerships, performance indicator, progress, and if there are funding uh, resources available or different examples, we've also included that. 
so again, the, the plan is really extensive. Um, and so I don't suspect or expect any, all of those here today have had the opportunity to review it at great lengths, but I'm happy to discuss further if there are any questions. And with that, we're at the recommendation. So that report to PDR CW 1421 regarding the county's age-friendly community strategy and action plan project be received, and that the age-friendly community strategy and action plan be endorsed which will help guide corporate strategic plans and priorities, and that staff be directed to develop a proposed work plan to move forward with the actions, recommendations identified in the plan in collaboration with local municipalities and other community partners, and that staff be directed to share the strategy and action plan with all member municipalities for their information with a presentation to local councils should that be requested. And that concludes my presentation and happy to take any questions or offer any additional thoughts at this time. Thank you very much for that, Stephanie. Uh, are there any questions of Stephanie? Well, start with Councillor Mackey, okay? Thanks very much, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council. Thanks very much, Stephanie, for all the hard work that's been done. Uh, in, in the report, it talks about uh, under housing, uh, the there's not enough smaller units or in between. Can you talk about what other in between options are for, you know, individuals leaving their family home, um, you know, in the countryside and wanting to move to town? The other types of options that you're referencing there, please. To you, Mr. Gordon. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mackey. Um, I would I would note that this is likely an area that the county is has already made a lot of moves toward in acknowledging that we do need a, a, a broad range of housing variety types to accommodate the needs of all, all ages and, and abilities. Um, so the, the type of housing, a couple of examples. Um, so it would be the accessory residential units. So those were, would be ones where you could have um, success, succession planning where you have multiple generations living on site. Um, also just the, the acknowledgement, um, we had a, an individual share a comment around, um, they, have, uh, they had a teenager, um, so it was their daughter that had um, accessibility um, needs. And so she required an accessible space to live. And there is acknowledgement that most often we think about accessible spaces um, when we're catering to older adults. And so the only available rental for her or space to live as a family, a young family, was in a, a, a facility that was typically geared for 55 plus. And so that's another, and, and just an example of a gap of housing where we don't have maybe those apartment units or smaller units that are typically geared for accessibility for all ages. Um, and yeah, just looking at um, different like bungalow styles or townhouse, just again, getting away from, not getting away, but having lots of different variety where you, you may have limited upkeep, upkeep for your yard um, or if there's like snow clearing purposes and that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, again, the, the county's Repeller Gray official plan has captured a lot of those provisions, um, but it's really just, again, expanding the scope of, of what we're looking at when we perceive accessibility as well, making sure we're not missing any age groups when we account for those development types. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that response. I certainly concur with uh, there is a, certainly a demand for people that uh, can no longer stay in their homes and are looking for those apartment style. And uh, uh, they're very popular throughout Gray County. There's just not enough of them. There's long waiting lists on any of the uh, developments that we have. The work that was done as, as far as uh, home and community supports, a lot of people are able to stay in their home with a little added, added support, but the support's not just there. So what can we do to increase the amount of support to allow someone to remain in their, their home? To you, Mr. Warden. Another great question, Councillor Mackey. Um, a couple of the action items in the action plan 
um, do speak to, um, we, we are aware and acknowledge there's, a, there's resources, so funding resources that exist in terms of retrofit grants, um, but people may not be aware um, of those grants that extend beyond these walls. And so looking at the action item in, in one of the action items in the plan is to really communicate what resources exist to, to facilitate and assist people stay in their home or, or existing community um, that they currently reside. So that's an example where if they, in addition to the home and community support staff, um, but it's also looking at, can you retrofit your home to support your needs going forward? Um, but can we better communicate what's available? And can we offer assistance to people that have questions about the application process? Um, helping them implement and receive that funding is, is something that we've identified as a gap and opportunity that we can help fill. Thank you very much. Next will be Councillor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, thank you, Stephanie, for that great report. Very comprehensive. A lot of topics covered there, no doubt about that. The question I have is <clears throat> regarding the financial impact to our community as a whole. Um, I'm sure there's opportunities here, uh, but undoubtedly there'll be costs as well. And I'm wondering, in your travels to generate this report, uh, did you come across what those financial impacts or opportunities might be? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, that's a great question, Council Milne. Um, so just making sure I understand correctly, the financial impact specifically for the respective municipalities and counties to implement the plan. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's a really good question. And uh, thankfully, um, as Nadia had shared through her presentation, having the a strategy and action plan with respect to age-friendly community initiatives in place is a conduit for future grant and funding opportunities. And so it's demonstrating to the province and those that offer grants that we've done the foundation work that sets that platform that we can then extend our efforts for funding opportunities. And I, I do want to uh, shed light on the town of Hanover. They've done, they have an age-friendly community group um, and, and council on aging. And they've already done quite a bit of age-friendly community work over the years. Um, I do want to, I did connect with a couple of members of part of that group and specifically Sherry Walden that works in the Parks and Rec Department. She said that over 90% of the works that they've done have been funded from the province. And so it's the acknowledgement that there's a lot of funding for this type of work that's available. And so the financial aspect of implementing this plan is, for, from my perspective, quite minimal in terms of what the county or municipalities would have to commit. Um, and that's where the, if we were able to have a staff allocated for the implementation, implementation of this plan, um, acknowledging the human resources are sometimes um, limited so that's the part that we'll really have to figure out. If we can have a, a leader in-house that can really offer those supports, that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, in terms of funding availability, it's, it's incredible what's out there. And I, I think more often than not, those, those funding resources aren't completely allocated. They, they're just underserved. Um, so I, I think it's a, a great opportunity for us to, to start connecting to those resources because they are there. Yeah. Nadia, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Thank you, um, Mr. Warden. And yeah, I just want to echo um, through the uh, Ministry of Seniors um, uh, and accessibility, um, there's always a um, grants every year there's community grants there's um uh the the names sometimes change but there's always a community grant a seniors age friendly grant um there's also opportunities and funding available through other government levels so through canada mortgage housing corporation with their retrofit um programs they um there is funding for sure and 
I think the province of Ontario, and I've been doing these age-friendly plans since 2016, the, the types of grants that are being issued, um, they're being more creative. They, uh, there's a commitment there. And I think an acknowledgement as well that age-friendly communities, planning for age-friendly is not gonna go away. And so the funding is there. Um, and one of the things that I do for our municipal clients, even when our project is over, um, I still send news about, hey, there's funding available for this. And so that is just something um, that I like to do to, um, you know, we're all busy and I know emails can sometimes get lost, but you know that is something that I would continue to provide to Stephanie in the county whenever I see a grant or an opportunity. Um, just, I think again, messaging and communication. So, uh, uh, just to reiterate what Stephanie said, there are fun funding opportunities, and it's not always through the provincial government. Um, and one of the ways that I stay up to date with that is I subscribe to a lot of. Um, provincial ministries yes but also like cmhc there's like the e-news feeds and that's how i learn of these uh the opportunities through that so um there is money there and having this strategy and action plan in place will give the county will give the lower tier municipalities that extra um um weight to say here's how and this is a specific action that we would like funding for so this is the the tool to really open up that door and to help your chances for funding applications thank you thank you madam cao i would just add that there are many recommendations in this report that aren't about hard infrastructure so much of what makes our communities great is the people that's in them and the relationships that those people have with each other. COVID has done very little to help the world of volunteerism and people's ability and willingness to, to step up and be part of, of communities and to help their neighbors. I think that as we, as we recover, it's so important that we're all thinking carefully about how we can bring people back together in a face-to-face -face way, how we can create opportunities for people to help each other, and how we make sure that everyone knows about the opportunities there are to step up in a volunteer way and how important that is. We really need to celebrate the people who are being the coaches and you know coming out to help with all sorts of community events so that we can maybe build some of that back. And I think that work doesn't necessarily need to cost us anything in, in our dollars and cents, but if we make that a priority, maybe other things can come up from there. Councillor Keeney, you're next. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Stephanie, for this very important work. Um, I wanted to ask you to share a little bit more information on the potential for applying for the uh, age-friendly designation from the WHO with the completion of this report. Are we close to being in a position to do that or do we need to implement some of these initiatives that are uh, outlined in the report before we could apply or just uh, where do we stand in that process, do you think? Do you, Mr. Warden? Uh, that's a really good question, Councillor Kidney. Uh, my understanding, and Nadia could potentially weigh in further at this, this response, but my understanding is that we do have the resources and information now available that would allow us to submit an application to the World Health Organization. Um, again, it, it, that application and acknowledgement, if we were to receive that, it's expressly communicating to the public in the community at Gray that we are taking further efforts. So we've established, again, that foundation. We're taking further efforts to continue that work. Um, so it's not such that you have to be entirely age-friendly um, in the sense that this action plan would be entirely completed. Um, it, it's that we've established that foundation. We've acknowledged that we're taking the efforts and initiatives to proceed with this work going forward. And so we can submit that application today, how we have 
um, with, with the resources that we have and what we've completed, which is great. So it, just another um, piece, it, piece in our hat to communicate to the public that we are committed to this work and that we um, are, are seeking acknowledgement that extends beyond the county's borders as well. So it's, it's great. Thank you, Nadia. I saw your head bobbing up and down. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. One of the things I also wanted to add to Stephanie's um, um, response is that it will also place Gray County on an international map. And so when you go on the World Health Organization's website, site and you can search you know age friendly communities there are a number of countries sometimes even like smaller uh, um, neighborhoods and there is a spanish name for a community it's not coming to me i should have looked that up beforehand i apologize but you can have access to so many different um places to learn about projects um, as well and just to share that information and 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 I and I think it's there's some really incredible projects on there and just examples that um, you know we don't have to start from scratch right there might be information there with a few clicks away and just the, the connections and there um, one of the things that I also want to mention is that um, in speaking about you know the e news ministries and other government levels that I connect with. Um, there's also the International Federation of Aging, the IFA, and you can also connect with them as well. And they have um, a whole host of information webinars that are free on a variety of topics. Um, and so all this to say is that the age-friendly community planning um, internationally has really um increased and the awareness of bringing this to anything that a community does and it's not just hard infrastructure it is about people um and so um just i encourage you when you have a minute to you know poke around on the world health organization's website and um and it's quite fascinating because i always say um you don't have to be an older person to reap the benefits of being in an age-friendly community. And um, at some point in our life, we're going to need some assistance or we're going to know somebody who needs assistance. And it's not always an age thing. So just to give you an example, my nephew um, has spina bifida. So there were a lot of accessibility issues that he had. And my sister had to deal with. So um, it's, it's a really great opportunity to strive for more, celebrate what you are doing, be part of an international community and, and, um, and hopefully have those opportunities in person. So um, I just wanted, sorry, I've kind of added more than <laughs> my original thought, but I wanted to just uh, mention that there's a lot of great information out there for uh, for you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I don't see any other hands either in the room or, oh, <laughs> there is a hand, Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And uh, through you, I just want to, <clears throat> you know, speak for a minute on uh, Kim's mention about volunteerism. And, you know, it is very important throughout, uh, you know, our small communities. And Often I think it's a matter of trying to link up the individuals that need the support and the individuals that, uh, that want to do the volunteerism. So maybe there's a role for us to think a little deeper about what actions we could take to you know, properly vet people that want to be volunteers and then to link them you know, through some sort of uh, mechanism to the people that need the support. It's going on on a regular basis now. Family members do it, neighbors do it with the seniors that live down the street. But a new person to the area may not know who they could uh, reach out to for help. So there may be some, some role that we could take in trying to find those linkages. Because I do believe there's a lot of good people out there that want to you know, support their neighbors and, uh, and friends and family or, or newcomers to the area. So maybe it's something we could seize upon. Thank you. 
Thanks, Councilor Mackey, and that's a perfect segue to our second <laughs> delegation, isn't it? Um, oh, Stephanie, go ahead. To you, Mr. Warden, um, Councilor Mackey, we, we do have one of the action items in the plan does speak to that, and it's creating um, more comprehensive, again, just resources available for people that are looking to enter and initiate and be part of any volunteer opportunities. Um, one of the pieces that has recently changed, which makes volunteerism a lot easier, is that um, people can access their police checks online. Um, and as well, I believe the fee has been waived, which has been a significant barrier in the more recent past for people um, that may just not have the disposable income or funds to help um, in that respect. So yeah, it is an action item that we've acknowledged that it's not so much maybe that the people that aren't there that, it, that aren't there um, to support these volunteer efforts, but we just need to help facilitate that communication component to really make those connections. Because again, through this, this project, we've we realized that the, the county has a lot of extensive networks that already exist. Um, but yeah, just looking at what those gaps are and really supporting those efforts. Thank you. Um, two quick things, uh, Stephanie. One, on page 83 of the action plan, it talks about quick wins. And in that section, it, it refers us to the, um, I guess, short term, the one to two year um, uh, items. I wonder, is there, a short list to the quick wins? That's a good question, Mr. Warden. Um, I, I would be able to provide that um, in, in writing. I, I think just being able to look at the action plan, how it's been iterated today. So we do have the short-term and medium-term timeframes. Um, those timeframes as well are simply acknowledging the um, start of an, an, an initiative. And so it's um, not necessarily indicating that that's when it would be completed. Um, but yeah, some of the, the quick wins, again, would extend or um, kind of uh, be, be those pieces that exist that wouldn't necessarily re require funding. Um, so some of the, the policy initiatives or endeavors, um, those are, again, um, acknowledging a lot of the great work that we're already doing. And so we've, we've established those networks and understand what the community needs when it comes to housing um, or incorporating some of those pieces in implementing the, the cycling trails master plan, record field trails master plan. Um, so those are some of the building on what the, the, the great work that's already been completed today uh, would be a, a piece of a quick win that we could definitely help implement. Thank you for that. And uh, I have to acknowledge, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Councillor Carlton, but I did see your uh, head nodding in, in approval on a number of points. Uh, not to put you on the spot, was there anything you wanted to add? Because I saw your head nodding in approval uh, quite a bit. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm actually on the on my other laptop here on the World Health Organization website, and I just did a search under Age Friendly Canada. And it's amazing the number of cities and information that's there already. I also, I think this is an awesome thing for us to be working on given some of the other committees and things that are happening such as the newest one, the mental health and addictions. I think this is all supporting everything that we're already doing. So yeah, I'm nodding, thank you. <laughs> Not nodding off, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll confirm that, <laughs> very good. Um, I don't see any other, any other hands. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, our second delegation is ready. Um, yes, um, and oh, sorry. So let's do that. I'll call the question then on the motion before us. All those in favor? In the room, that's everyone. And online, that's everyone as well. So that's approved. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to check in with the folks. We've been sitting for you know uh, over an hour now. Uh, and with respect to our, our guests, uh, the second delegates, I would like to take, you know, uh, say come back at uh, you know, 15 minutes, come back at 11.30. Uh, would that be okay with our delegates? I don't see them. Well, I, I'm, I'm seeing that there are a number of people that would like to take a break. So I'm gonna suggest that we, <laughs> that we take that break and that we reconvene at 11.30 sharp. We'll see you then. You can turn off your mics and cameras. Thank you, Mr. Thank Warden, you. all the best.
requests for implementation of this plan. So, my apologies. Thank you very much. It's Nadia, okay. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. bye.
Okay, I believe that we are back. We do have quorum. So we're going to be going to our second uh, delegation. I believe, is Barb going to be making the introductions? Uh, Jacinda. Jacinda, okay. Hi, Jacinda. Come on up. It made it easy for me. <laughs> Good morning, County Council. So my name is Jacinda Rudolph, and I am one of the Economic Development Officers at Gray County. I also oversee the Gray Bruce Local Immigration Partnership uh, project that you'll hear more about again. Um, today, with both delegations, we wanted to bring attention to the important work that not only we are doing at county level, but also the work that Welcoming Communities Gray Bruce is doing in creating welcoming and inclusive communities. So last year, the government, the federal government, welcomed about 405,000 um, permanent residents to Canada. So, you know, there really is a strong economic need to increase migration. And so what they did is over the next two years, they are welcoming um, about 1% of Canada, about one per, just over 1% of Canada's population, they're going to welcome um, immigrants to the area. So it goes up to about 420,000 immigrants um, each year over the next two years. So as part of that, they're also modernizing the immigration system so that they can address some of the key challenges uh, for newcomers to integrate into the workforce. This really highlights the opportunities and values, the value of implementing the supports, the resources, the networks in, and the infrastructure and attracting new immigrants to our region and addressing some of the workforce challenges that we're all very well aware of. Even more so, retention. Retention of community integration, uh, retention and community integration of immigrants is just as important and sometimes even more important. And that's why we collaborate with partners like the Welcoming Communities Grey Bruce that complement and strengthen the work that Grey Bruce Local Immigration Partnership does. So we invited David Morris, who is the chair of the Welcoming Communities Grey Bruce, um, organization and Kime Ip, who is one of the board members, and I believe they're joining us virtually. Thank you, Jacinda, and thank you. I, I guess I'm supposed to be on now. <laughs> uh, the and thank you, Mr. Warden and uh, members of council for giving us the opportunity to present to you this morning and give it, give, giving you a quick overview of uh, our activities and our accomplishments over the last uh, number of years. I would go to screen share. There we are, if I may. Uh, this one. Okay. Come on, computer. There we go. Um, so, let me go back. so as I say, I'm, I'm, as Jacinda said, I'm the chair of Welcoming Communities Gray Bruce, and they'll be sharing the presentation with me, Eep, who's one of our valuable volunteers and who has worked with us on a number of the projects that I'll be briefly talking about this morning. Um, to me, this slide kind of embodies what, why Welcoming Communities Gray Bruce. It's our vision that this area would to help make this area an area where everyone feels welcome here, regardless of who they are or where, where they have come from. And we are the result of a merger of four small informal organizations that have been been working on this type of work for 17 years in the longest case and seven years for some of us um, doing a variety of things in terms of activities and research and consultations uh, all of which are designed to make this area more welcoming and inclusive uh, in 2016 we began to cooperate on a number of projects and through that we realized that there was some um, some sense, to, uh, particularly from a fundraising point of view, for us to uh, uh, merge together. And so in 2019, we uh, came together as a nonprofit corporation. But again, that just summarizes our goals working towards an inclusive, uh, welcoming Gray Bruce, where differences are celebrated 
and no one is left behind or left out. There's a picture of our board uh, from a couple of years ago before COVID. Um, we have added a couple of people to the board since then. So we're now a board of nine and we have two, our two workers in the front there. Um, I just want to say we deliberately created a very inclusive board of the nine people on the board. They represent seven different countries of origin because we believe that if you're working to address the concerns of a particular group, you need to have input from that group and have them involved in the planning and, and development of whatever it is you're going to do. So what the types of things that we have been doing over the years, and we'll talk a bit more about each of these categories as we, as we go along, uh, we've worked to, to assist uh, newcomers in uh, any form, any type, uh, immigrants, refugees, and others here um, to, to settle here, and that's both been directly and indirectly. We've engaged with the community uh, on a number of levels and consultations and discussions and uh, research, and we've collaborated with a great many uh, types of organizations uh, and businesses, including public sector service groups and local council uh, governments, and uh, we'll continue to do that. In terms of the um, types of support that we've been able to put in place through our projects, we've created a number of tools or handbooks for directed for the newcomers themselves, for employers, for our service agencies, and for people wanting to volunteer to, to assist newcomers. Uh, those are print copies or PDF. Um, We've also created some online resources for the uh, for the newcomers, um, and May is going to talk a bit about some of those in particular. We've been involved with uh, other groups and organizations to help them uh, strengthen their service and add to services to better uh, assist newcomers and other people with limitations, all towards the goal of increasing the capacity of this area to be more welcoming and as Jacinda said, a place where people want to stay. So I'm going to turn it over to May. I hope she's on connected online as a, as a presenter at this point. Thank you, David. And thank you, Council, for having us today. So as, uh, as David introduced, I, I, I'm not a board member, but because I, I've been with the welcoming communities for a very, very long time and, and involved in, in almost all of the projects. So I um, the board thought that it would be appropriate for me to, to be here today to talk a bit about um, some of the projects, just, just to highlight a few. Um, so um, the welcoming community, Great, Great Brews, started en engaging um, community stakeholders in um, collaboration on different um, uh, initiative and program long before it became a, a officially a, a nonprofit organization. So one of the very successful event is the One World Festival that started at the Great Bruce One World Festival that started in 2010. That's the year that I moved to and sound from Great from uh, Salvo Beach after living there for 16 years. So I've been here for a long time. Um, so the, the, great, the Great Bruce One World Festival's target is um, elementary school kids. So every year uh, until the pandemic hits, every year we have thousands of um, uh, elementary school students um, bust into the Owen Sound to, to enjoy a variety of performances and, and, um, and their vendors uh, from different organizations uh, showing um, um, get engaging uh, kids in act different activities and providing information about um, different um, groups in, in the communities who are usually, um, unfortunately, being the groups that are marginalized or maybe they have challenges in in integrating into the, the communities. So um, some of the, the um, partners that, that are involved when they come uh, one more festival are the uh, community living on sound uh cmha great blues um the school of course school board and and um and uh and also community members like myself who wanted to to promote diversity and inclusions and in recent years um the welcoming community started to focus more on uh support for newcomers because we're seeing the trends that there are more and more people coming into the the area but unfortunately some of them leave because there's no infrastructure to support them 
So in 2018, if I get my dates right, um, 2018, um, the uh, uh, United Way of Bruce Gray and Welcoming Communities received a funding from the provincial government from their, at that time, that was the Ministry of um, Immigrations or something like that. Um, so, so the the project is called making was called making Great Bruce home, and it was particularly a, a research de and development pro projects to to identify ways to help refugees and and vulnerable newcomers to integrate in into our community. And um, in 2000, in 2018, and then 2019, uh, again, the uh, uh, welcoming communities, uh, Great Bruce, and also and the, the uh, United Way of Bruce Gray uh, partner again. And this time, we received the funding from IRCC to work on the pathway for newcomer immigrant women in Great Bruce projects that that address employment barriers that visible minority new, newcomer women um, face in the area and find out ways to, to, um, to uh, find, find a way to, to, to collaborate, find uh, for a stakeholder to collaborate and address the barriers. And, uh, and then um, last year, I believe uh, there was another, another collaboration that which is with the Georgian College and also with, with Great County in on the research of um, how to, how to uh, retain international uh, students who came to Georgian College to study. So those are just uh, some, some examples of, uh, of uh, how uh, we engaged um, uh, different stakeholders in our initiative. So if um, David can, will you please move to the next slide? We're not in the same location, so I rely on David. I don't know. I don't know what's happened. It's quit. The, it's not, okay. uh, it's not changing I, slides for me. I'll, I'll keep talking and then uh, you can just get there when you can oh, my, my computer's frozen up for some reason unfortunately mm, okay so yeah so so like like um um as, as david explained uh we have through the projects we developed various tools um and that is the intention of the re, the, the research and development uh, project because we wanted to not just just report what it is at the present time but we wanted to to, to provide recommendations um, in a form of, of um, printed and online resources so that so that organizations that uh, to follow after our projects will be able to to use some of our knowledge that we oh, develop sure. to continue to support um, uh, newcomers and immigrants so some of the some of the the one of the very valuable tool is the is the uh, success for everyone so that will be um, it is a is it it is a document that we created through um, identifying the employment barriers that are faced by newcomer immigrant women um, through the rural pathway projects, and then develop some develop implement and evaluate some of the trainings for employers and service providers, and also still building workshops for. Um, newcomer women and and from the from the our learning we we developed this tool and we we think this will be a very um, valuable tools for all employers and service providers to use now that we have we have the GBLIP is really great that so we have the GBLIP that that will bring together all the stakeholders who are interested in retention and recruit, recruitment and retention of newcomers and, and really care about their social, economic and civic integrations. So our tool that this uh, success for everyone is not, although we, we develop it through working with women, but it's not just for women because um, it's uh, all, 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 the, all the concepts apply to, to how to work with and, 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 and collaborate and, and, and support uh, newcomers in general. Um, so back to you, David. Okay, um, as as May highlighted over the over the years, we have uh, collaborated with a, a number of uh, various organizations. The um, ones that are ongoing right at the moment is working with the the YMCA in town on the the um, settlement services, which uh, 
uh, we were quite instrumental in, in helping complete the application to bring to bring to get the funding for that project and are still part of we are a partner with them and the, on the advisory committee. We had the input with the, the Gray and Bruce counties and in, in planning for the project for the great local immigration partnership. Uh, Mays talked about her newcomer collective, I believe already, or or will in a minute. And so, uh, and we are cur currently collaborating with the Gray Bruce uh, Legal Clinic to improve support for migrant workers. And I'd also mention that we're also uh, working with a group from Ryerson University on their project to uh, study why the factors that why migrants stay in, in small communities. The focus is often on why they leave, but this project is, is working on why they stay in it. We think we can give them lots of good information in that regard. So May, back to you quickly. Sure. Okay, so so I would like to add that the, the tools are all on the uh, the welcoming communities website, uh, which is uh, welcominggraybruce.ca, I believe. And um, so this this picture show a group of women, including myself. So this is actually a, a very new group called the um, Grey Bruce Newcomer and Immigrants Collective, the uh, Women's Collective. It is actually a, an outcome of um, of the Rural Pathways projects because um, through participating in the skill building workshops, some women realize that yes, uh, we 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 do have the capacity to to help ourselves and advocate for ourselves and all and advocates for other newcomer and immigrant women. And they, as the project, you know, everybody knows that when pilot projects done, when funding is gone, there's not, nothing, right? So you can leave resources for hopefully other people will use it. But but the desire of this group of women is so strong that we decided that we, we're gonna stay together and see what we can do in, in developing a actually a group that an entity that will support newcomer women. And thanks to the welcoming communities um, to who gave us a, 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 a kickstart. So the, the, the collective is happening. Um, we are at the stage of developing the, our strategic plan. And, and, um, and also in the meantime, we are also co connecting with more and more newcomer women. And, and the other pieces of it is um, we are actually on the, at, at the Grey Bruce uh, lip table, which is really nice because I think I think we the the collective bring the voice of newcomer women to the table so that that promote the understanding of newcomer situation in the in uh, among the stakeholders. So um, thank you, May. Um, so when, as we were working with other organizations, we. Um, have a, a common set of values, uh, particularly the desire to make this, as we've said a number of times, the area to make this more uh, uh, inclusive community for everyone, uh, believing that we can make progress and we know that we have made progress in that regard. And uh, re recognizing that um, as we break down the barriers and make this area uh, more accessible and welcoming for any group, that we make it better for everybody including those of us who've lived here for, for, for some time. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, some of the concerns that we've identified, uh, again, these are not new uh, to you folks, I'm sure. Um, we've noted that there are a number of groups of people who are, are new to the area that are not covered by the programs that we ha currently have, particularly um, the refugee claimants, migrant workers, uh, international students, uh, uh, there are still, unfortunately, barriers of various kinds, both uh, intentional and unintentional and systemic in the way our services are offered that uh, make it difficult. Um, and again, I'm just uh, so there is work for us to continue to do it in terms of raising awareness of the need for inclusivity and diversity and equity in this area. And particularly, again, making sure that the voices of the people who are most affected are involved in those plan developing those plans and policies. Um, so, in terms of where we where, where we're going, uh, we're more fairly well staying the staying the course. Uh, in some ways, uh, collaborating with the Y, the local immigration partnership, uh, the, the collective, the uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, 
Um, and we also are very open to working with municipalities in terms of helping them uh, develop uh, an equity, diversity, and inclusion policy for themselves. And uh, again, all towards the goal of making this a, a better area for everyone. And we are also available to help on, with training programs and introduction to this whole theme for anyone interested. So who's, who's helped us over the years? Gray and Bruce County, of course, and the local immigration partnership, the Y, the Chamber of Commerce, um, inclusive communities. But we wanna particularly highlight United Way because they've been a very valuable partner in terms of us, in terms of, of getting grants. Community Foundation has supported us. And in terms of the upper levels of government, we've got funding from the federal level and, and from the province on a number of occasions, basically. Uh, much of the funding that for what we've been able to do has come from the upper, two upper levels of government. So that's, um, so we, there's our website, um, Welcoming Gray Bruce, uh, where you can get more information on this. And again, I thank you. And I realize that we've probably gotten over quite a bit over our uh, 10 minutes. So I appreciate your, your uh, patience and your tolerance in that regard. And we're certainly available for questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh... May, and thank you very much, David, for that uh, update on your very important uh, work. Council, are there any questions? Uh, delegates? Councillor Keaveny. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and thank you, uh, David and May, for your presentation. Um, I noticed on your list of um, organizations that you work with, the Owen Sound Chamber of Commerce, and I wonder if there's potential to engage with the the other chambers of commerce is within uh, Grand Bruce counties to uh, assist in, in raising awareness of, of your programs and the supports that you offer for newcomers. We are, we are certainly open to that. Um, we understood from our conversations with the uh, Owen Sound District that they, they covered a lot of the area, but certainly uh, we are more and more than well, more than interest, more than willing to work with anyone that uh, wants to, to um, share with whatever we can, however we can assist them. Just COVID's made it difficult, <laughs> as you well understand. But that was part of our reason for coming today was to try and raise awareness that we are here and we're willing to help. Right, and perhaps a follow up to that, Councillor Keaveny, perhaps uh, our staff could uh, provide um, our delegates with a list of the various uh, chambers of commerce uh, throughout Gray County. And Jacinda, probably taking notes, right? I see your hand there. Good. <laughs> Any other questions of our uh, delegates? Uh, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, no question. I just wanted to thank May and David for the presentation. And thanks very much for everything that you do. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, if, I, if I might comment, Mr. Warden, uh, the, the, in the previous uh, presentation, there was reference to the what can be accomplished by volunteers and uh, what you've heard this morning from us is basically done with volunteers. Fabulous. Uh, Councillor Sewever, you're next. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. And I want to thank um, um, the presenters for all the work that they've done. And um, I think, you know, the need, given the events of last night, we will be seeing a lot more refugees and we do have a labor shortage. Now, the, the one thing is, I think there would be a lot of businesses welcoming the and, and people welcoming these refugees to, to our area. And certainly um, my own parents came as refugees. So um, I think the, you know, I think it's great work they're doing and I see a, a big increase in need. I mean, I think the situation in Europe is going to generate more than a small amount of refugees. And um, I think uh, this work should be supported. In terms of partnerships, um, we in the Blue Mountains, uh, for some reason, fall under the uh, Simcoe Muskoka United Way. So I would urge um, them to reach out to the Simcoe Muskoka United Way as well and 
a lot of the um, social services in the Blue Mountains are provided by volunteers like yourselves, uh, the Beaver Valley Outreach. So I'm just wondering if they've had any uh, communication with them. Um, not directly, no, we have not. We are certainly aware, aware of their efforts, but um, no, actually, we have not. I um, oh, then, sorry, May. Yeah, if I may, um, it, actually, they they were um, so uh, in the the making great Bruce home project um, uh, provided some uh, service providers training, and uh, and and I was a project project coordinator at that time, and 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 we did establish a a connection with the Beaver Valley uh, outreach at the time, um, and uh, we tried to engage them in the the second project as well, but because it's not so much as um, the, the our target uh, for the, the second project was narrower just for immigrant women and at the time there wasn't that many i believe in in um in, in in the blue mountain area but definitely we have we have the basis for reconnecting with them thank you thank you very I much if I might just add a comment to that, that's one of the challenges of doing this kind of work is to, is to get to know everybody that's out there that's doing something that intersects with what, what we want to do. And it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the LIP is certainly helping in that regard. And, it's, and we are doing whatever we can to connect, to make those connections. Well, absolutely, uh, Dave. Um, I don't see any other hands. Uh... Um, either online or in the room. I, I have one last question, if I might. Uh, you mentioned that uh, international students are not eligible uh, for your services. Uh, and we, we know that Georgian College has a number of international students. We met with them and they have uh, uh, expressed uh, challenges. Um, why is it that they, they are not eligible for your services? It has to do with the, the criteria that were set by the funding agency, which was the Immigration Revenue, uh, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, and for the services available uh, from the, the YMCA, the settlement services, uh, people have to be permanent residents, primarily, uh, or um, accepted refugees. So the groups like migrant workers and international students uh, don't fit the, the criteria of the funder. Um, under off the record, the Y certainly will do whatever they can to, to help those, anyone who comes to them. But uh, they've also uh, made application to the province for funding to try and um, close that gap. But we haven't heard yet whether they've been successful in that uh, regard. Uh, we're just still waiting. And uh, on the employment theme, they do have a, a small project that's um, working with the employers to to try and address the, what can be done to to make them make it a good fit. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, May. And you can't see in the room, but our staff are on their feet, so I'm anticipating that they'll have some input on that uh, last question. Uh, but I want to thank you for your time and for your uh, update uh, today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been our pleasure, and uh, we're looking forward to our continuing our collaboration with Gray County. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're going to be turning to item uh, five. Uh, oh, Savannah, sorry, go, go right ahead. Sorry to interrupt there. I just wanted to make a note about uh, the Georgian College, because um, David is correct, and we struggle with the same thing through the uh, GB lip. But as you'll remember, we did bring a report to council that uh, you graciously supported where we were able to support uh, the development of a position at Georgian College specific to support international students. Uh, so Madison Kittle did start full time in January. So she's now six weeks into the job uh, and that uh, support is finally coming into place. And that was thanks very much to County Council and uh, supporting half of that position that is no longer a one year contract. It is a permanent full time go forward position that Georgian is completely committed to and to help make these connections better and provide that support. So just wanted to make that note. Excellent, thank you for that, Savannah. And Jacinda, I saw you on your feet. Was there something that you wanted to add? It's been added, thank you. All right, so we are now turning our attention to item 5B. Uh, oh, sorry. Six, six. 
Oh, right, yes. <laughs> 60, <laughs> my apologies. <clears throat> uh, which is the update on uh, uh, the Grey Bruce uh, Local Immigration Partnership. That puts the PCA on deck. I need a mover, put the item on the floor. Moved by Councillor O'Leary, seconded by, looking for somebody online so I can include you all. Uh, Councillor Clumpus. The PICA? Good day. It's now afternoon, so I'll say good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Borden, and good afternoon, County Council. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, I know it's afternoon now. <laughs> so uh, we would like to share that the funding agencies, which is IRCC, covers our program delivery, as well as two county staff position, sorry, GBLIP staff positions, myself as the coordinator and Haley Moody as the facilitator. All right, thank you. Apologies for that, my first presentation. So, uh, so we have been supported by amazing Gray Bruce economic development staff. One is from Bruce County, we have Pierre Valley and uh, Manpreet Kaur Sangha. And from a Gray County, we have Jacinda Rudolph. So just to get an idea of what Gray Bruce Local Immigration Partnership is composed of, we are led by a partnership council, which brings together community partners invested in integration of newcomers. The partnership council is supported by GB Lip staff and is responsible for achieving goals and objectives outlined in our strategic plan, which was approved by IRCC, but and by both Gray and Bruce counties in 2021. So the partnership council, partner council, they meet quarterly and the subcommittees, they meet monthly and on bi-monthly basis and which enables organizations, the community organizations also to coordinate and work collaboratively, collaboratively to achieve positive cumulative impact. As part of GBLIP intention is to always begin our work internally and the partner council members are now being benefited by having two uh, opportunities in each meeting. One being a community guest speaker is always invited to share their lived experiences and a professional development to foster inclusive leadership. And from there, the members, they can take their learning back to their respective organizations and further utilize their knowledge to carry out more fo focused work throughout, their, throughout the committee committees. And as we can see, we have three subcommittees, employer subcommittee, which really focuses around employment. And we have community subcommittee, which focuses around community integration. And we have belong subcommittee, which makes sure that a newcomer feel that sense of belongingness. And some of the key initiatives we have taken at employer subcommittee is we are having employer roundtable to share on, and the topic is to share best practices and challenges in hiring and retaining and integrating newcomers into their workforce. The community subcommittee is currently working on the welcome package, which contains general information uh, about living in Gray and Bruce. And it also provides opportunities for municipalities to enter information specific to their municipalities. Uh, for example, the garbage collection days, community centers, Municipal, municipal services and the grocery store list, the childcare list and the banking information and how to navigate those. The Belong Subcommittee is working toward recognizing multicultural festivals and events in the region to better understand the cultural and ethnic group in Gray and Bruce. So, so the purpose of GBLIP is to support the unique needs of newcomer in the region. 
And in 2021, the settlement strategy and action plan were created. So identifying in that strategy, we identified four foundation pillars we need to work on. And we are working on building capacity by developing and implementing an inclusive leadership roadmap training resources to support the development of inclusive and equitable workplace practices in different sectors. Also, we are engaging all municipal municipalities in Grey and Bruce to integrate welcoming community characteristics. On, on strengthening community, we are aiming to achieve this by educating our partner council members on social integration and ways on how to develop social capital and connection, how they can be more built stronger. And also we are engaging our community uh, to op and giving them an opportunity to, uh, if, to host events that acknowledge the strength and diversity in the region. To cultivate prosperity, we are developing a resource hub for employers to connect and navigate the web of information and resources to recruit and retain newcomers, and also initiating the region-wide mentorship program that, that enables local citizens to support newcomers along their employment journey. And the most pertinent one is to foster inclusion. We are aiming to accomplish this by, this by supporting and developing an anti-racism and discrimination strategy and its implementation. At the same time, we are also increasing awareness of ethnocultural groups, including faith-based organization and their tradition in the region. Coming to the, to the accomplishments of 2021, 2022, we have categorized it in three parts, the community dialogues and workshops. So as we are entering the final quarter of the federal fiscal year, we want to share a few of the dialogues and the, and the participation we have done. So throughout the year, staff participated and presented in various organizations organized by partner members to share priorities and ways to collaborate more on to achieving the collective goal of welcoming part communities. For instance, as um, Welcoming Community Grey Bruce also mentioned in, the, in their presentation that uh, we had Afghan refugees move to the area and, and there was a lack of understanding and on how to better support them. So GBLIP hosted a workshop on Afghan refugees resettlement for local volunteers, settlement workers and English teachers working directly with the Afghan arrivals. We're also working on the website development wherein we are continuously adding information and resources for newcomers and employers to promote virtual events and interactions. The second is Southern Western Ontario LIP community partnerships. We are just adding a rural lens in there so that we are actively involved to, so that we can contribute and grow ourselves and we can better understand what the established LIPs, rural LIPs are doing to you know, move forward. And we are greatly benefiting through this dialogues, dialogues with another lips as well. And, and, and the same, for instance, in this uh, Southern Western Ontario lips, we hosted a housing consultation, uh, which was uh, basically dealing with refugees resettlement and their integration in the community. We, we had then we, we heard from landlords, uh, legal experts and newcomer settlement service providers in that com that a consultation. The third is National Local Immigration Partnership Secretariat. Because we are relatively very new LIP in the LIP world, so we are trying to be part of the National LIP Secretariat. We are, we are trying to volunteer in their executive committee members. We're trying to facilitate their research sessions. And we're also trying to participate uh, in, their, in their new uh, uh, new upcoming framework they have for developing anti-racism strategy for region-specific LIP, so Grey Blue specific LIP. So coming to the moving forward part, um, as per the strategic plan, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion trainings take priority in 2022. To achieve these priorities, GBLIP is partnering with local organizations, employers, and municipal leaders to provide training and education to expand knowledge of JEDI and introduce this practice into policies. So there are two key deliverables. We are working on it now. One is just a sector diversity and inclusion trainings. We are hosting diversity dialogues with municipal leaders and engaging all municipalities in Grey and Bruce 
which lays basically the foundation of a collective approach to cultivate inclusive and equitable culture in our respective organization and communities. We are also partnering with Nuclear Innovation Institute for, for five training sessions to learn about and understand equity in practice. The other one is the Train the Trainer project. The purpose is to create facilitated workshop in, on justice, equity, and diversity inclusion with region-specific content delivered to local residents. And a training manual will also be developed uh, for this project. The third is uh, last week, funding and partnership were confirmed to roll out a Gray and Bruce research project, which is an empirical study on discrimination experienced by immigrants, visible minority, and indigenous people in Gray Bruce. So this research project will give us an opportunity to measure the experiences of discrimination in our region, and will also provide county with a tool to self-reflect. With it, we can seek a better understanding and make positive change to create a more inclusive community where everyone feels they belong. And the fourth one is the 24th Metropolis Canada Conference, Vancouver. And the theme for this conference is Reopening Canada. They are looking into the future of immigration, settlement, and integration. And GBLIP has been selected to deliver a presentation on the value of partnerships in addressing challenges in retaining Georgian College international students to our region. The conference in itself is both an con opportunity for us to share our good work we are doing in our region. And at the same time, we will be, uh, it is an opportunity to bring new learning back to our region. Uh, just to conclude that uh, attraction, integration, and retention of newcomer continues to be a priority of Gray and Bruce as workforce challenges dominate. GBLIP is proud to complement the broader economic development portfolio and work in UNICEN to provide strategic and specific support benefiting all our communities and residents. GBLIP will endeavor to co-create a prosperous, welcoming, and integrating Gray Bruce where everybody belong, moving beyond the settlement strategy towards inclusion. Thank you. And any questions, any suggestions, any recommendations are welcome. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, Council, are there any questions that you have? I don't see any hands. Uh, oh, Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you very much, uh, Deepika. Is that a read? Thank you very much for your report. It's very, uh, very uh, comprehensive. Um, my question is, do we have any indication uh, in the future years how many uh, newcomers may be coming to Grey Bruce from outside, international newcomers from outside of Canada? And uh, I'd be interested to know how many are coming because I, I truly believe that that is the future of our uh, uh, two counties, Grey Bruce, uh, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, jobs, labor force, and all the rest of it. And uh, I look forward to the enrichment that those people will bring to our area, but I'm wondering if you can give me some insight onto how many, please. To you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councillor, for Councillor Mai, for the for the question. Uh, as far as the particular number, we don't have that number, but we are, the conversations are going on that IRCC has asked us because we are being funded by IRCC. So IRCC has asked us to prepare a video or a presentation to show people in, as their pre-arrival services that what is their outside GTA. So we are preparing that video just to, to submit to IRCC so that they show Afghan refugees who are coming up here or immigrants here that what is their outside GTA because as an immigrant who land in Toronto Pearson, they, they tend to settle there because they find their community there, they find the grocery stores there, they find their you know, faith-based organizations there. So they tend to you know, get comfortable with the job, even the survival jobs they are getting there. So 
now the focus has shifted toward what is there outside GPA. So now they are, IRCC is really working on that part. And we are hoping that uh, when we will be collaborating more with the organizations, like we have one rural employment initiative with Newcomer Central of Peel from Mississauga, we are trying to collaborate with more organized, such organization who can have that initiative. And that's how I, I came to uh, Gray County because I was, client, I was their client and I got to know this job opportunity and how the, I apply it. So I think that in that uh, part, we need to work more on for more collaborations with the organization outside our region so that people know that something called Gray County and Bruce County exists here. Thank you, Councillor Desai. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Uh, thank you, Deepika. Nice to finally meet you. Um, my question, well, first of all, I'd like to start Warden Hicks with, uh, I did have the uh, the honor, the privilege of being on uh, on the uh, Grey Bruce uh, lip for a very brief period of time through Grey Highlands. And um, the work that they do there is absolutely tremendous. Um, my question, uh, Warden Hicks, is what stories are we focusing on? Because at the end of the day, um, the videos that we create for, our, for, for IRCC and so on, they need to tell a story. Uh, what stories are we focusing on in Grey Bruce? And how are we ensuring that we're getting a diverse group of, of viewpoints, not just from uh, inter internationally settled migrants in, in Grey Bruce, but also people who've been here for a long time, the indigenous voices to really uh, showcase that we are a diverse population in Grey Bruce. So what kind of stories are we going to be focusing on? Thanks. To you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Desai for the question again. And I see that we have, we say welcoming communities, welcoming communities, but actually what welcoming communities, it has two dimensions. One is spatial dimension. When we say Canada has a region, has a town, has a county where new immigrant can go. And other is discourse dimension where we say we have agencies who help newcomers settle in and you know, avail all those services. So we do have a settlement services here by MCA. We do have community organization who help navigate newcomer to you know, uh, get through that process initial phase where we, we tend to, we have all the clients here. Like recently we got to know that YMC has 200 and something clients. I'm, I'm not sure if with the exact figure for the new immigrants and we are continuously following up and we are collaborating basically on them, with them on that note. And we are trying to focus on the immigrants who have been here like less than five years because IRCC has their new immigrants condition as five, less than five years. So we are focusing on them. And also we are focusing on, on international students who are on their way to permanent residency and who are in Gray Bruce, Gray County right now. So we are focusing on these two and we are also not just promoting the, uh, you know, that we got, there are characteristics, like the first is employment, in the welcoming community, we have 17 characteristics and the first top three one being the employment and the, how, to, how we foster social capital and if we have affordable housing. So we're really trying to you know, work around those three areas. Like I would happily be part and volunteer of that video saying that I happily got a house here, even though it was a stressful, but then I got it. So uh, all these international students, and if we have religious-based organizations, like we have Muslim Association here in, in Gray County, and all educational opportunities considering Georgian College here. So all these factors will be taking the community, welcoming community characteristics in our video. Thank you for that detailed answer. One of the things you touched on was uh, Georgian College and international students there that are on their path to permanent residency. Um, and perhaps you don't have the number off the top of your head. Uh, is it possible for us to find out um, how many international students there are as a percentage of the total students at the Owen Sound campus? Um, and out of those, what percentage of those are applying for a permanent residency and what percentage of those intend and continuing to stay in Grey Bruce? Um, are those numbers that we can find out? And 
the context for that is it's important to see how many people move to uh, Grey Bruce for the educational opportunity, first of all, and then second of all, how many continue to live in Grey Bruce after a three, four year program? Because I think it's very important for, for newcomers to feel welcome. And if they feel welcome for, the, for that initial period, um, they, they're more likely to continue staying there. So is it possible to get those numbers at all? To you, Mr. Warden, uh, that's an actually excellent question because we do have international student coordinator in place right now. We, we are continuously meeting with her as well. And one of our partner council member is Georgian College. So we can certainly get those numbers and percentages for you. And so that we can you know, better work on them to stay here rather than they going into Toronto finding jobs. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm looking online, no. Yeah, I'll call on Savannah if there are no other questions. Savannah? Thank you. I was just gonna ask if maybe uh, Dipika or Jacinda could give a, a little update on the Train the Traino project in a little bit more detail, uh, because I think that goes to what Councillor Desai was asking in terms of you know, the stories and how it is that we're looking at um, this work because it really is a mix of newcomer and local long-term voices and how those two pieces come together. So I'm not sure who wants to take a shot at it, but I just think this would be a great opportunity to give you a little bit more detail. Through you, Mr. Warden. So the Train the Trainer project is about a 18 month project. And what it does is build capacity from within. So the trainees that are part of it bring their own lived experience, whether it's their identity, their, um, their culture, their ethnicity, and so on. And uh, we have actually 17 individuals throughout Gray and Bruce that represent um, newcomer voices, indigenous voice, as well as long-term resident voices. And the idea is to build their knowledge and their, and their awareness and train them on topics such as justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. That's, uh, we've just recently confirmed a consultant a consulting group that will work with them over the next year and slowly integrate uh, their skills and their, their knowledge and being able to provide training to the community as well as member municipalities, staff members, employers on the value of, of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion in retaining um, immigrants and, and diff different voices to the table. Um, so, so that's underway. I also just wanted to say about the, um, just with regards to the international uh, student. Um, the federal government is also putting in special measures to grant um, permanent residency status to some of the temporary residents that have come through, uh, that have the healthcare, that have been working in healthcare, because um, that is something that we need in this area. Uh, I don't, as, as you probably know, if, if immigration is a, you know, going from temporary to permanent uh, status is a long process. So that's part of the modernizing the immigration system. So that would help with regards to what we're doing in, in retaining some of those international students. Um, you know, I, I know before the pandemic, there were something around 40 to 50 international students that were studying at Georgian College. And uh, recently, uh, you know, the borders opened up and now they've, they've introduced, um, I don't know the number, but a significantly higher number. And there's, they're also looking at uh, attracting uh, nursing students from outside of Canada. Um, because there weren't as many, there are a lot in power engineering, and we also need, you know, the infrastructure to be able to retain some of those skills uh, worth what we're working on. And then also uh, nursing students, there are more nursing students, international, uh, international students in the nursing program um, than there were before. And that is definitely a need in our area around workforce needs. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Desai, go ahead. Thank you. You mentioned, uh, Jacinda, through the warden, you mentioned um, the special measures uh, put in place by the federal government. Um, are there any guarantees, per se, to ensure that the students continue, or, uh, the students who've moved from temporary residency to permanent residence continue to um, uh, work or live in the area that they, they've applied from, uh, perhaps? And I'm not sure exactly of the process of it. But for example, if someone going to 
Georgian College in Owen Sound applies to become a permanent residence, um, in order to be fast tracked, is there a stipulation that they have to continue living within Owen Sound for X number of years? For you, Mr. Warden. Um, I have to say, Councillor Desai, that the guarantee is really around whether we are welcoming communities, whether we have those supports and those networks and we have the integration piece into the community, not just, not just the workplace. So we're, we're working towards it, but there's no guarantee for anyone to come here. And even if you, you know, hire them through the immigration process and they were to gain permanent residency status, which is definitely a kind of a concern once they're uh, working for an employer, um, there's no guarantee but the guarantee really lies within how we welcome them and how we can keep them to our area and whether we're welcoming, whether we build that awareness and the education around um, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. So that's really what we're kind of trying to work on with the Train the Trainer project over the next 16 to 18 months and um, not just have GB live or welcoming communities or settlement. It's also uh, residents and uh, uh, member municipalities and their staff as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the Pika, is there anything else that you have? No, if that's the case, then, oh, my apologies. I did not see your hand. Councilor Keefney, go right ahead. Oh, it was on and then it was off. Okay, <laughs> I apologize. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask Jacinda about, um, Awareness for small business owners, thinking of in my own place of business, I was involved in supporting an international student through the process, and you said it more than once, it's a very long process to permanent residency. So I'm wondering, um, with your work, and I assume you're working with Fort County, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's more opportunity to work with our Chambers of Commerce is to get uh, some education to our small business owners to help them understand how they can participate in the process. I mean, it was, was new to me, so I assume it would be new to some other small business owners and, and how we can reach them and, uh, and help them create jobs and, and support people through the process uh, to permanent residency. Um, for you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councilor Keevney. Um, so actually we work uh, really closely with the Business Enterprise Center and in the next few weeks, we will be uh, reaching out to small businesses to invite them to a workshop around creating an equity, um, an EDI policy. And in that process, you know, the training involves bringing that awareness piece of the benefit of opening up or, or changing your policy or addressing the needs um, of, of newcomers as well as um, the equity, diversity, inclusion piece. Um, so we'll be, we'll be promoting that to the chambers and um, to see if all small businesses want to be included. Uh, with regards to hiring practices, um, you know, it is a long process and we're definitely available at GBLIP to be able to provide small businesses with the resources and, and, and the, uh, the knowledge on how to be able to maybe um, bring in newcomers to the area, bring in immigrants and or retain them in their workplace. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any other hands. Uh, hopefully I'm not missing anyone. That's very good. I, I'll resist the urge. I was gonna make a comment about the Jedi training, but uh, I'll really <laughs> resist the urge. Uh, the Pika, anything else for you? Am I pronouncing your name properly, by the way? Is it the Pika or the Pika? The Pika, thank you. And congratulations. So you, you've now finished your first presentation to council and you did a great job. Okay, Council, it's time to call the question. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to receive this report? That's everyone. Thank you very much. No one being opposed, that's carried. All right, so Council, I am in your hands now. We have two items uh, remaining uh, to deal with. Uh, one is the planning approval delegation and then the one item that was pulled from the consent agenda. So option one is we break uh, now for lunch and come back and deal with those two items. And option number two is we push on, complete the two items, and then uh, break all together and we can have lunch. Uh, so how many people would like to break for lunch now and then come back? 
I see no hands in the room and two hands uh, um, uh, online. Um, so <laughs> with that said, it seems to be the majority of us. For the people who had their hands up online, do you need to maybe take a, a, a really quick break or anything like that? Uh, yes? Yeah, so why don't, why don't we do that? Uh, we'll take five minutes, let's say. So it's now um, 1231. If we come back at uh, uh, 1236, it will give everybody a chance to have a, a quick break and we'll come back and, and finish up those items, okay? <laughs>
I think we have quorum, right? Rob, are we good to go? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Just get us back. I, I forgot to say sharp when I said 1236. <laughs> so, so, all right. Um, we're going to be dealing with item um, 6C, uh, which is the planning approval delegation that puts uh, Scott, I believe, <clears throat> on deck. I need a mover to uh, get things going here. Councillor Gamble. There we go. <laughs> Councillor moved by Councillor Gamble <laughs> and seconded by, I'm looking online now, Councillor Hutchison. Scott, you have the floor. So uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and good afternoon to the Warden and members of Council and anyone tuning in today. Uh, it's been a, a morning full of some some really good news stories, and and uh, and uh, now we have a 35-page planning report before lunch. So I apologize in advance, uh, but I will say that this report has been a team effort, and, and there's been a lot of people that have reviewed and provided input into this report, from Kim and Randy and Michael Eterno to various members of planning staff to the discussions we had with municipal planning staff, as as well as the surveys that were filled out. So uh, we're really really appreciative of all the people that provided input in this regard, uh, including the comments we heard from, from uh, both municipal and county councillors as part of the survey process. I will also say, just as a preface to, to this report, this is a big report. There's a lot of information in here and there's a lot to consider. And I realize uh, for, for members of council, you've only had this for, for about a week. Um, so certainly staff are here to present the report today. We're here to answer any questions you have. Um, but if, if there's some notion that you'd like more information or you'd like a chance to speak more with, with municipal staff, um, then certainly staff are happy to, to work with you if there's a deferral here today to, to get any further information you need or to facilitate any of those further discussions. So it is a big report, it's a big subject matter, and, and we're happy to do anything we can to uh, support Council's decision making in the future in this regard. So with that, I'll, I'll just go through uh, some of the highlights of the report. Uh, as Council may be aware, this came about as, as a resolution from the October 8th, 2020 uh, Committee of the Whole session, uh, whereby there was some correspondence from Blue Mountains asking for some potential uh, planning approval delegations. And, and uh, the ultimate motion that was passed that day was a little broader to look at it countywide, uh, not just Blue Mountains. So that's what we've done. I will say in this regard as well that Delegation of, of planning approvals are nothing new in Gray County. Uh, years ago in the 1990s, the province delegated uh, subdivision and condominium approval authority uh, to the county. And then around the, around the time of amalgamation, uh, the county de delegated uh, land division or severances uh, uh, to member municipalities. So this is something that has changed over the years. And it's certainly something that uh, depending on council's uh, um, decision going forward uh, could, could change again in the future. I will say with respect to um, the current state of approvals in, in the county, eight of our nine member municipalities are, are very similar in that regard, in that uh, either the local councils or local committees of adjustment approve things like uh, minor variances, consent applications, zoning bylaws, zoning bylaw amendments, and, and holdings uh, and, and um, site plan control in that regard. And, and then the county generally approves uh, new municipal official plans, municipal official plan amendments, uh, subdivisions and condominiums, and, and um, uh, county official plan amendments in that regard, save and except for, for five or 10 year reviews or new county official plans. Owen Sound is treated a little differently in this regard. And, and the reason for this is because uh, prior to rejoining the, the county at, at around the time of amalgamation, uh, Owen Sound had delegated authority to approve subdivisions and condominiums. And so when they rejoined the county, they did keep that authority. Uh, so that's why there's there's been some, some changes in, in uh, how those approvals look in this regard. I will say with, with respect to the legislative framework, uh, the county is legislatively required to have a county official plan. And the county has had that official plan in various incarnations in effect for a number of years. Municipalities have the option of having their own official uh, municipal official plan. Eight of our nine member municipalities have chosen to adopt official plans, uh, but they don't have that same requirement that the county does in that regard. In that regard, the county also has uh, delegated authorities from the province with respect to reviewing and commenting on municipal applications and municipal planning documents uh, from a provincial perspective under their municipal plan review process. 
so in that regard, uh, county staff are obligated to, to uh, review those, uh, those uh, applications and policy documents uh, to look at matters of parental, provincial interest under the Planning Act and, and to be consistent with the uh, provincial policy statement in that regard. Um, in the report, there's a couple tables. Uh, the first uh, summarizes the approvals that I've just gone over. And the second table summarizes the existing uh, staffing levels in, in planning departments across our, our member municipalities. And we focus specifically on the number of planners employed by our municipalities. And so that's not including things like administrative support. It's not including uh, technical support that you might find from a planning technician, such as, uh, such as uh, geographic information system support. Uh, and, and uh, other duties that they may have. And I will say, even within that table, you'll see that there is a wide variety of, of planning resources across the county, from those municipalities that have fully staffed planning departments uh, to those municipalities that actually don't have any planners on staff and, and employ contract services or, or divvy out some of those tasks to, to other staff in that regard. Um, the key takeaway there, though, is, is that there is a broad range of resources, but in, in many cases, those planning resources aren't doing just development review or development application planning. Uh, there's lots of, of planners uh, across the county that have other duties as well, from um, overseeing building and bylaw departments uh, to, to uh, wearing joint hats in terms of planning and economic, economic development. And even in our own county planning department, of course, we, we, we have uh, planning, but we also work on the, the forestry and trails portfolio too. So the numbers are a little bit deceptive just to see on the paper. I just want to, to add some, some caveats to that. With respect to the current planning approvals process, there's really three main types of applications that have a public process associated with them uh, that county council or county committee of the whole is, is the delegated approval authority for. And those are subdivisions and condominiums. And I'm gonna use those two terms um, somewhat synonymously because the process is very similar uh, for the two of those. Uh, there's county official plan amendments and there's municipal official plan amendments in, in that regard. I will say that most often when we have an application at the county level, whether it's a subdivision application or an official plan amendment application, there's quite often a, a partner application at the municipal level. So if we have a subdivision application, uh, there might be a rezoning at, at, at your municipal table as well. And, and so most often those applications are submitted uh, jointly. Uh, they would submit to the county and member municipality on the same day. And then staff between the two municipalities would work together to, to process those applications in an efficient manner. And, and there's ongoing dialogue and coordination and communications, um, actually even from the pre-submission uh, process. So if we get an inquiry at the county or if, or if you get an inquiry at the, the member municipal table, uh, quite often we'd convene a quick meeting uh, between county staff and municipal staff um, to talk to the developer about what might be required going forward into the development uh, review process. And, and so municipal staff would be speaking on behalf of both their own municipal planning departments, um, but also speaking on behalf of, of uh, partner departments in your municipalities. So it might be your transportation or engineering staff, or it might be uh, things like parks and recreation. And similarly, when county planning staff are at that table, we're representing not only county planning, but also uh, working on behalf of, of some of our other county partners, uh, like transportation services or economic development or, or county housing staff in that regard. Some municipalities have chosen to go with a development, de development review committee, which formalizes that inquiry process, and others do it on a more ad hoc basis, whereby they pull together a meeting as, as soon as we get an inquiry in that regard. Once the applications are received at the county and municipal tables, uh, we would work together with municipal staff to, to determine whether or not we have what's called complete applications. Uh, quite often, both the county and the municipality would each delegate a staff person uh, to be the lead on that application. And then we, as county staff, would work with that municipal staff member in that regard. In the development review phase, again, we'd be coordinating with, with the various different uh, uh, functions in the county and the municipality to make sure the different departments are getting circulated and, and providing input into that. Um, when it comes to advertising for a public meeting, again, we'd work together and, and send out a single notice to the public uh, that a, a meeting is coming up and, and uh, have a sign posted on the property. And in that case, county staff are flexible. There are times when municipalities would prefer the county to do that circulation and, and uh, order the sign through our county sign shop. Uh, and there's other times when municipalities uh, want to take the lead themselves. So um, we, we make sure that the wording is that's needed is on the sign and, and, and in, the, uh, in the notices. And it really doesn't matter who sends it out. Uh, there's only one notice being sent out in that regard. 
With respect to public meetings, I'm sure it's no surprise around this table, those meetings are held at your either local council or, or some have delegated them to local planning committee tables. Uh, especially in the pre-COVID times when those meetings were always in person, it's much easier for, for members of the public uh, to get to, to uh, a location generally in their own municipality uh, versus say having to come up to, uh, to Owen Sound for a meeting at the county in that regard. Um, so in that sense, we have two types of meetings. We have a joint public meeting, which is the type of public meeting we'd have um, when we have a county official plan amendment in play. And, and that's where we do need a, a representative um, from county council. And then with respect to subdivision and condominium meetings, uh, that's a delegated meeting. So it's, it's the municipal council or municipal planning committee uh, that's holding that meeting on behalf of, of uh, the county in that regard. In either instance, county staff are in attendance either in person or virtually uh, to answer any questions that might arise out of that. In terms of the development review phase and, and trying to respond to public comments or questions or initiating peer reviews, again, that's all done in concert with municipal staff. Uh, when we look at a peer review, a peer review is only done once. Uh, and so whether it's being let through, through uh, a municipal purchasing department or through our own county purchasing, it's covering the needs of both the county and the municipality in that regard. And again, county staff are flexible as to how that gets done because some municipalities have uh, peer reviewers on retainer that they use. And, and so as soon as a peer review is needed, it's, it's, it's uh, farmed out directly to that consultant uh, versus other times we go to a competitive bidding process. Um, but the key is to make sure that we're not, uh, we're not double dipping there and having a review at the county and a review at the municipality. Um, similarly, with respect to responding to uh, public or agency inquiries, uh, in some cases, it's very clear if it's an inquiry about the county road, then county planning staff would work with transportation services to make sure we get a, a response there. Or in other cases, if it's a, an inquiry about a, a municipal service, uh, then uh, the municipal staff person would usually take the lead there. Um, when it comes time to making recommendations to our respective uh, committees of the whole or councils or planning committees in that regard, uh, county staff uh, never bring forward a recommendation to this table without first hearing from the municipality. And in some cases, municipalities have delegated that authority to staff to say, yeah, you're free to advise uh, the county that either we have concerns or we don't have concerns. And in other cases, those go through municipal planning committees or municipal councils. And so typically things like uh, draft plan approval of a plan of subdivision, uh, the municipal planner would present draft plan conditions to their planning committee or council in that regard. They would be endorsed by council and or changed by council and then come up to this table for approval. Um, sometimes on official plan amendments, that's a staff delegated authority at the municipal level. And then when it comes to, uh, to appeals, um, in some cases, we have appeals of, of both applications at the county and municipal level. And so we've worked together with, with municipal staff and, and uh, municipal legal counsel where feasible um, to, to uh, uh, collaborate on that and, and uh, ensure that uh, the county and the municipal interests are represented in accordance with any appeal protocols that might be in place at the county or municipal level. I will say that in, in working with municipal staff, um, both in the planning departments and other departments, we have tremendous respect for, for the job that they do and, and what they bring to the table in terms of, in some cases, that local knowledge, um, both of, of, of uh, council's direction and, and a public opinion in that regard. And, and uh, you know, we always learn from dealing with them. In some cases, what county staff bring to the table um, is a broader perspective. And in some cases in, in a municipality where, where you might be experiencing a certain type of application or a certain issue, um, for the first time, sometimes county staff can share experiences um, that we've already run across in other municipalities. Uh, particularly when you get into um, some details around condominiums, they can become quite complex. And so if as a municipal staff or, or municipal legal services are dealing with that for the first time, uh, there's times when, when county staff are able to bring that broader experience. Uh, and other times when, when county staff would reach out to provincial staff in that regard uh, to get further perspective in that regard. Um, when we're reviewing these applications, we are reviewing for different things. Uh, in some cases, our, our partner departments are reviewing for different levels of infrastructure, whether it be servicing at your municipal tables or county roads at our, our county table. And even in the planning perspectives, uh, from a county level, we're reviewing mainly with respect to the provincial policy statement and our county official plan uh, versus your municipal staff would be reviewing more so from the, the municipal official plan, if there is one in effect, and, and your zoning bylaw right? zoning bylaw or any other guiding documents that might be in effect there. So in terms of um, trying to, to put together this report, um, 
We, we undertook a number of surveys. There was four surveys that went out, uh, first in 2020 and, and then later in early 2021 to try to garner further input. There was a survey to municipal and county councillors. There was a survey to municipal planning staff and, and planning related staff. Uh, there was a survey to developers and consultants. And there was a, a fourth survey to our neighboring counties to find out what they do with their planning services in that regard. So surveys one to three were all very similar in terms of getting people's opinions on uh, what, uh, what perspective they have on delegation, uh, what they think about the current process, what could be changed, uh, where there could be further efficiencies, et cetera. Uh, the survey that went out to our neighboring counties was, was more abbreviated in that regard. And it was really just trying to learn about uh, what they do uh, between, uh, between their, their county level uh, government and, and their member municipalities. The, the survey is attached, warts and all, uh, to the back of this report. Um, you know, I, I won't go through it in detail other than to say that there was mixed responses. And in all four of the survey categories, there was mixed responses. There were some people that saw great, uh, great uh, benefits and, and, and pros, if you will, to, to delegating certain uh, planning approvals. And there was others that, uh, that uh, had concerns and, and had questions about that. Um, and, and there wasn't a uniform response in, in any of the surveys in terms of, you know, some of the municipal and county councillors uh, all had different opinions. Some of the own municipal planning staff had different opinions. And, and even the developers and, and consultants had different opinions. And so we gained a lot of valuable feedback from the survey, both in terms of future uh, delegation consideration, but also in looking at where we could find uh, planning efficiencies. And I will say, because the survey was done in 2020 and 2021, it definitely represented a snapshot in time. And, and there's been improvements at both municipal and county level since then um, that have already, in my opinion, made the process more efficient or, or, or made our respective planning departments easier to deal with in that regard. And some of that was out of necessity in terms of uh, suddenly having to go paperless and go online based on the pandemic. Another was based on improvements that had, had already been sort of in the works and, and were finally just implemented uh, in that regard. But the, the survey results were very valuable, um, but we need to consider them as, as a, a product of their time and, and they will continue to evolve over time as well. With respect to what our neighboring counties do on their planning approvals, um, it really is a mix. And, and, and we just surveyed the, the, um, the, the counties that, that uh, border Gray County in that regard. And so you have examples like Bruce County, where Bruce County provides all the planning services at the county level, um, to places like uh, Wellington County, which are more like Gray County in that regard, in that there's, there's planning services at the county level and at the municipal level. Um, the main difference in Wellington County is that um, they still have a county-based land division committee. Uh, Simcoe County is particularly interesting in this regard, and you'll see in the report there's a link to a, a mem memorandum of understanding um, from Simcoe County. Simcoe over the years has delegated uh, subdivision and condominium approvals to 14 of the 16 of the member municipalities in Simcoe. And, and so we, we got a lot of information from the processes they went through, and in talking to staff there, even that process has, has evolved quite a bit over time from the first time they delegated to a single municipality uh, to the 14th in that regard. Uh, so they've been a great resource to learn from. I'd also like to highlight um, Huron County because Huron County had a particularly interesting model on, on some of their staff delegations and approvals in that regard. So with respect to uh, consent applications, uh, consents are approved at the county level, um, but consents are approved and delegated by staff unless it's a contested application. So you go through the process, you circulate, you get feedback from the public and agencies. If nobody has any concerns, it's delegated to the director of planning in that regard. If there are concerns or questions in that regard, then it would come to, to uh, um, county council in that regard. And so I think this is a great example of, of maybe where uh, the province is, is seeking for counties and municipalities to go in that regard, uh, to look for efficiencies in the process. And are there uh, certain types of approvals or certain types of applications that maybe can be entrusted to staff? And, and then there's other processes where we still certainly want uh, uh, council's uh, um, um, approval on. And, and the other body that we were able to engage with in this regard was the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And, and certainly they confirm that the county does have the legislative authority to delegate subdivision and condominium approvals if they so wish. We don't have the authority to delegate official plan amendment or official plan approvals in that regard. And the ministry simply recommended, um, similar to what we've heard from, from other uh, neighboring counties, that if we were going to look at delegating, or if council was going to look at delegating approvals, sorry, um, that there be some criteria established uh, to understand um, what needs to happen in, in order for delegation to be successful. 
With respect to um, the delegation of approvals and that legislative authority in speaking with Michael Turno, um, that would come at a later date if council saw fit uh, through council passing a bylaw and also a memorandum of understanding uh, between the county and, and the member municipality that was seeking delegation in this regard. And, and so that memorandum of understanding, if, if council were to support this report, would come back to council and would come back to your own municipal councils to, to you know, see all the details uh, before, you, before you sign on the dotted line, so to speak. Um, we also heard some very interesting anecdotes from, from some um, municipal staff that had been through a delegation of approvals before in terms of understanding how big a process it is. And, and um, council might be able to appreciate even through the length of our planning staff reports, uh, how big some of these planning files can get. And, and you know, back in the days when we were using paper, you know, they, they could be quite thick in that regard with, with hundreds of pages of material. And you know, one of the, the anecdotes that we heard on, on the delegation was that when the county delegated to the member municipality, um, they scanned and copied um, every single document in their files before passing it on to the member municipality. So A, that's a, a huge task for the county and B, that's a lot for, for your own municipal staff to receive in that regard, both in terms of digital files and in terms of um, paper files in that regard. And so there'd be a lot of work from a records management perspective um, with both our clerk's department and our IT department. Um, so it's, it's certainly not something, unfortunately, that can, can happen overnight, but uh, we're, we're starting the discussion here now. With respect to that delegation, um, staff outlined three types of um, scenarios for delegation in the report. And, and, and that's what we came up with, but we're certainly open to feedback from council or from any of our member municipal staff in that regard. So one would be to delegate subdivisions and condominiums on a go forward basis only. So that would be if, if someone came in, you know, let's just say council delegated as of uh, December, 2022. So if someone came in in January of 2023 for a subdivision or condominium, that would go to that local municipality. But any existing files that are in process in terms of subdivisions and condominiums uh, would remain with the current approval authority. So for everybody except Owen Sound, that would be the county. Um, there is some merit to this approach in that it's nice and clean and you've got a, an effective date and, and uh, you know everything that the county is, was already working on, we're still working on. And then we've got this nice clean go forward date. The challenge staff see with this particular approach is with respect to um, confusion from both the public and from the development community on um, longstanding developments. Uh, so let's just say we had a subdivision that was approved in 2019 and somebody needs to come forward with a change to that. They're phasing their approvals or they need further changes. You know, do they go to municipal council or do they go to county council in that regard? So um, staff see some benefits, but also some, some um, challenges with that particular option. With respect to option number two, um, that would be delegating both on a go forward basis as well as on a retroactive basis. So whatever that magic date became, um, again, if, if council were to decide that December of, of 2022 is the magic date, um, at that point, um, the, the municipalities would, would receive a, a large um, delivery of files, both digitally and, and paper copies, and, and they would be the approval authority uh, there forward. Um, that's how the province delegated uh, subdivision approvals to the county in the late 90s. And, and uh, that's certainly the option at this stage, pending further discussions that county staff would be recommending. There are, of course, some challenges to, to, to this option as well. Um, I touched on already in terms of just the, the, the sheer volume of files and, and of paper and, and digital files and everything else. Um, but there's also challenges in terms of some of those files that we have in process already. Um, so if the county were to have be begun processing a, a um, planning application, what happens to the fees and the deposits that the county has already collected? Uh, what happens with respect to the legislative timeframes that we have to process that uh, application under? Will municipalities be able to pick up that application and still process it in an efficient fashion in that regard? Um, the other challenge there, and, and, and actually one of the delays for, for uh, taking so long on this report, is we've still got a lot of what we call legacy subdivisions and condominiums. In some cases, older approvals that date back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s from when the province was the approval authority um, that either have no approval yet or have a draft approval with, with no lapse date. And, and so county planning staff were working with municipal staff as well as our own legal services staff to look at options for, for 
for lack of a better word, for cleaning up some of these older files. In some cases, um, it might be a, a development that's no longer feasible. In other cases, we might need to reach out to the developer and just say, hey, listen, what can we do to, to work with you to, to revive this one, to make it happen kind of thing. Um, and in other cases, it, it could be uh, a case of the developer has since sold the land and, and the person who bought the land doesn't even know they have a planning application in process. And, and that becomes a complicated process, not just because of the volume of the files, but because of the, the changes in legislation over the years. And in some cases, in order to determine what happens with those files and any appeal rights associated with those files, it dates back to the planning act that was in effect on the day that the application was submitted. Um, so it's not a quick process. So long story short, we haven't um, figured out a strategy for this yet. Um, but that's something if we were to delegate, we'd want to work with member municipal staff on in terms of dealing with some of these legacy uh, approvals in that regard. The other uh, concern with the, the retroactive basis uh, delegation would be if we have a subdivision or condominium that's actively under appeal right now, where the county is a party before the Ontario Land Tribunal. Um, so we'd certainly want to discuss that further uh, with, with both municipal staff and, and municipal legal services uh, to see what that would mean. It might mean that the county remains a party until the Ontario Land Tribunal has, has rendered their decision in that regard. And then finally, the third option would be uh, sort of a hybrid approach. It would be delegating retroactively and on a go forward basis, but uh, to a certain date. So it might be that your municipality approved their new official plan in the year 2017. So maybe that's the effective date, July 1st, 2017, if that's when the, the new official plan was, was approved. Um, and that gives you a nice clean policy basis for, for uh, considering these applications. There are some challenges to this approach similar to um, option one, whereby it could get confusing for developers or the public uh, with respect to changes of some of those older applications. With respect to um, some of the criteria that county council and municipal councils could consider for, for a, a memorandum of understanding, we've outlined some of those in the report and we borrowed heavily from the, the uh, memorandum of understanding that was shared from Simcoe County in that regard. So it's, it's um, some very straightforward stuff in terms of, you know, do you have um, the requisite uh, planning staff resources at the local level? Uh, do you have legal resources, whether on staff or whether on retainer that can assist with those processes? Uh, should you look at a public meeting to figure out uh, uh, what your residents and, and developers want to see in that regard with respect to uh, delegation? Are there training needs that need to be done? Are your municipal planning documents, such as your official plans and zoning bylaws up to date? Uh, do you have a fee schedule in place for, for processing those applications? Um, what level of reporting would be required back to the county on some of these applications, knowing, of course, that uh, that growth in, in each member municipality is, is uh, important not only to your, your member municipalities, but also to the county as a whole. Um, things like uh, looking at impact on infrastructure and, and, uh, and such are all important. Um, the files, of course, would have to be processed in accordance with the Planning Act, and, and there's a number of other um, criteria that are listed in there, and if Council were to support moving forward with that MOU in that regard, um, we could certainly um, look at examining those in more detail. I will say one of the surprising results that came out of the survey was that there were some um, municipalities that didn't want full delegation, but wanted only a partial delegation in that regard. So there was a particular municipality that raised the fact that they'd love to be able to approve part lot control applications, but they don't wanna approve subdivisions or condominiums. And so if we were to look at the, the full delegation versus the delegation light, uh, that MOU might look very different in that regard. So it might, might need to be tailored even between municipalities if there were multiple municipalities that were, uh, were asking for delegation in that regard. So if council were to delegate and, and, uh, and certain municipalities were to take on um, um, these, these approval roles, you know, the, the immediate question is, you know, what time savings would there be at the county level and, and what would staff do with all this newfound time? Um, and so in, in this case, we haven't been able to accurately quantify exactly what level of time savings that would be. And part of that is because we don't know yet who's requesting uh, delegated approvals, and we don't know yet uh, whether they're requesting the, the full delegation or the delegation light, if you will. So, so that can come at a later time in terms of uh, figuring out exactly what that might be. But staff estimate for a planner's time, if we were to delegate the approval, um, it might result in roughly uh, one third of the time we would normally spend on say a subdivision application being saved. So there are certain things that we would no longer have to do at the county level. We would no longer be sending out notices. We would no longer be ordering signs from the sign shop. 
Um, potentially, we would no longer be writing staff reports to county committee as a whole. So no doubt there would be some, sa some time savings there. Um, and it might vary depending on the, the types of application. With respect to the, the time from, from some of our, our partner departments on, on reviewing these applications, we don't see a lot of time difference there. So with respect to um, uh, transportation services and, and Pat's team, you know, whether they're reviewing the impact on a county road and reporting back to county staff or whether they're reporting back to, to municipal staff, they still got to review the impact and it'd be very, very similar in that regard. Um, with respect to, to how we could use some of this newfound time, you know, some of it would, would go probably towards reducing the amount of overtime that's worked by county staff. Um, and, and certainly in, in this most recent sort of development boom uh, and, and due to some, some staff shortages that has been, uh, has been increasing. But we also see um, potential if, if there is um, time savings to focus on some more countywide strategic projects. Um, so the project that was uh, presented to, to Committee of the Whole this morning, the Age-Friendly Community Action Plan, is a great example of that. Uh, that's something where, and I have a biased opinion being a county staff member, the county took leadership there um, and, and was able to produce a report uh, and an action plan that's going to benefit not only the county and our member municipalities, but various stakeholders across our community. And, and uh, there's lots of other examples that, that the county has been able to collaborate on with, with your own municipal staff. Uh, and, and there's others currently in process, such as the climate change action plan, where, you know, if we had less time being spent on some of these development review applications, um, we would, we would um, maybe be able to allocate more time towards that. Um, we will say that Based on the current process, we would still be involved in reviewing the applications, but we wouldn't have the same level of review as, as we do when, when uh, the county uh, council and county committee of the whole are the approval authority in that regard. Um, one of the other questions that's been raised throughout this whole delegation process, and, and uh, it's been raised, I've heard it a few times by, by residents and by ratepayer groups, um, is the potential for conflicts between the decisions of your own municipal councils and county councils. And, and uh, in some cases, there's a fear that that county council is going to pass a decision that's completely against the wishes of, of, of a municipal council and, 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 you know, for lack of a better word, they're going to override the, the autonomy of the municipal council in that regard. And, and Yes, that could happen. I will say that with respect to subdivisions and, and condominiums, um, as staff, we can't find a single instance in the past 15 years uh, where the county has made a decision that was then appealed by the host municipality, so the member municipality. Um, and, and part of that is because we work so collaboratively with your own municipal staff and, and we don't bring forward um, um, recommendations to this table where until such time as we've heard from municipal staff and or municipal council. No doubt there has been some friction over the years and, and no doubt there's been some times where we needed to, uh, to sit down and work things out. But generally by the time it gets to this table, um, there, there has been concurrence and, and we've been able to incorporate uh, the feedback of, of the municipality and, and uh, municipal staff with respect to uh, subdivision and condominium approvals in that regard. And, and the possibility for conflict in this regard um, is really no different if we have delegation or not. So if we look at some of the decisions that are made by, by your municipal councils and municipal committee of, committees of adjustment, uh, such as consent applications or zoning bylaw amendments, um, there's, there's clear authority there from the municipality to be making those decisions. But there are times when, when the county has concerns and, and there, in extreme cases, there has been times where county staff have had to recommend um, appeal of those decisions. Sometimes they've gone forward and sometimes they haven't. And so that could happen you know, really regardless of, of who's making the decision. You could have either the county feeling that its concerns weren't met, uh, or you could have the member municipality feeling that, that their concerns weren't met. But sort of the key takeaway is we really try hard to make sure we're, we're on the same page and, and we're um, having regard for all the input from municipal council and municipal staff and, and, uh, and residents in that regard. So the final piece of this report was looking at process efficiencies. And, and this is something that in my opinion, regardless of whether or not uh, there, there's any delegation of approvals, there is always room for process efficiencies. And, and that's come through loud and clear in terms of some of the, the recent provincial direction uh, with respect to affordable housing. And certainly we're going to be seeing uh, further legislation that uh, might be leading us further down that road in that regard. So there have been some, some uh, positive processes already, already instituted in that regard. Uh, so a number of your municipalities have instituted development review committees uh, where you invite county staff to sit at that table in terms of reviewing applications and, and pre-submission consultation proposals. Um, there's been more and more move towards paperless applications and online applications. There's been more information shared online. So rather than uh, a, a 
member of the public needing to come in and look through our hard copy paper files, they can find the information they need online. Uh, with respect to the county's processes, we've um, implemented a one window process whereby your municipal staff circulate the document to, to the county planning department, and then we would circulate internal, internally to each of our, our uh, internal departments to get comments there. Um, we have abbreviated some of the comments that we would typically offer on, on a um, municipal application, such as minor variance, where there's very little impact on county services in that regard. Um, as I noted earlier in the report, there's joint peer reviews being done, so that uh, so we're not duplicating review efforts in that regard. Uh, there's been some technical guides created by the county in concert with municipal staff to try to better inform applicants of you know, what it means to do an environmental impact study or what it means to do a functional servicing report and, and what sort of the, the minimum level of criteria we need to see are to be successful in that regard. Uh, and then there's been other process efficiencies in terms of delegating certain approvals to staff. Um, and that's happened in some cases, both at the county and municipal level, uh, whereby uh, council has had oversight over certain matters and, and others are delegated to staff. So what are some of the changes that we could improve upon in terms of going forward? Um, we certainly see um, a, an opportunity to better streamline some of the inquiries that come in. In some cases, uh, that first point of inquiry will come to uh, county staff or even a member of county council. In other cases, it might come to, to uh, municipal staff in that regard, but we need to make sure that regardless of who gets that first phone call or who, who gets that first email, um, that we have an efficient process in place and we're right we're, we're providing great customer service um, with respect to handling those inquiries. Um, we think another major step forward here would be ensuring that we have proper memorandums of understanding in place uh, with the four conservation authorities across Gray County, both at the county level and at the municipal level to ensure that uh, they're providing those efficient uh, comments on, on natural hazards and, and we're opted in on natural heritage as well. We also want to ensure that there's adequate staffing levels at both the county and municipal level. Um, some of the results from, from the survey, you know, we heard comments along the lines of staff are doing an okay job or a good job, but they're taxed. There's just so much on their plate at the moment and, and they can't process these applications as quick as we'd like to see them process the applications surely based on the sheer volume of it. Um, there's also, I think, an opportunity for, for additional training to both staff and council. Um, and this isn't just planning staff, it's, it's staff in a number of different departments um, with respect to a responding to these development applications and, and providing that customer service, while also understanding um, what role everybody plays in the process. And I think particularly as we move towards a municipal election and where we might see some changes at our municipal and county council tables, I think it's a great time to, to really fine tune our messaging and help everybody understand what their role is. Because I think in, in the past, and I know I speak for myself, there has been confusion in the past. So we'd love to work with municipal staff and councils in that regard. Um, we also see a, um, an opportunity as you're working through your own municipal official plan reviews or new official plans uh, to look at reducing duplication um, between what's already in the county official plan. And so some municipalities have taken leadership in this regard in terms of the Township of Georgian Bluffs or the municipality of West Gray, uh, whereby their uh, municipal official plans cover their settlement areas, their growth areas. This is where we really want to see development. And, and they focus the policy efforts in the agricultural and rural areas uh, to the county official plan. So in that sense, it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's a little bit more streamlined and, and we don't end up with situations where we're doing a, a double county official plan amendment and municipal official plan amendment. Uh, we also see for see opportunity for uh, increased advances and in things like online payment for application, online submissions. Uh, we've made great strides in that regard and there's, there's still some ways to go. Uh, we think we can take the lead from some of our municipal partners and, and look at maybe having uh, peer reviewers on retainer um, such that when we do get a need to peer review uh, an element of an application, we have someone ready and waiting to go and we can reduce the time frame needed to, to hire that person. And then we think there's further opportunity for, for staff delegation in that regard. And certainly we've seen some of that through recent direction in, in uh, the province's Bill, one, Bill 13, uh, which allowed municipalities to now delegate things like uh, temporary use bylaws or holding symbol removals to staff. And I think we're going to maybe see more of that in, in future legislation. Um, so I think we do an adequate job of communicating between staff right now, but I, I, I do think there is opportunity that we can move forward based on the feedback we've heard um, for, for further, um, further streamlining and, and efforts in that regard. And, and so finally, just to wrap up here, with respect to the, the legal aspects in the budget, as I noted, we, we do have the ability to delegate uh, what's, what's included in the motion in terms of subdivisions, condominiums, part lot control, and condominium exemptions. 
and and uh, we don't have the ability to delegate some of those other planning approvals and and those would come the the subdivisions and condominiums and part law control would come through a future memorandum of understanding and and uh, part law control bylaw i will say with respect to um getting this delegation done should council decide to go in that route uh it will take some time and and staff are recommending that through the motion um we go back out to our municipal partners to determine exactly who wants to to receive those approvals and uh, that municipal councils decide whether or not they want to opt in or opt out in that regard and and once we have a better understanding of that we'll have a little better idea of of, of how we're going to move forward and, and what resource and, and budget implications that might be uh, staff are thinking at this stage that if there is more than one municipality that makes that request, um, that we might need to go one at a time, and we might need to look at uh, uh, having one municipality go first in that regard, uh, just based on on the resource levels at both your own municipal table and and the council at the county table in this regard. So I realize that was a very long winded presentation. Uh, I will just turn it over to Randy just in case I've missed anything here, and then certainly staff would be happy to take any questions. I think Scott's done a fantastic job of summarizing the report and hitting all the key highlights. So thank you, Scott, for for uh, taking us through uh, through that journey and that that report. And uh, obviously, like Scott said, we're here to answer any questions. And as Scott indicated the, at the beginning, this is a lot to digest. We recognize that. Um, you know, if, if council feels that they need some additional information, we're happy to try to collect that and gather that with further conversations with your local municipal councils and local municipal staff. Um, so that's something that, you know, uh, is an option to, to council for, for sure. Um, but we're happy to take any questions today or any comments uh, from council. Thank you very much for that. You're right, a lot packed in there. Uh, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, uh, Scott, you talked a lot about collaboration with the lower tier municipalities. Um, but in this recommendation, the second one says you're going to share this report with lower tier municipalities. Is that for information purposes only? Or are you specifically with this report, are you engaging with lower tier staff and getting input? Sure, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, good question, Councillor O'Leary. So uh, the, the, the purpose behind item two in the recommendation is, is, is kind of twofold. Um, we have engaged with municipal staff um, pretty much since council made the original motion on October 8th in 2020. Uh, so there was a number of municipal staff members that filled out that survey and we've had local planners meetings and other such things. So as much as anything else, we're looking to um, update them on where we're at in this process, um, give them some further information in terms of what we've been able to research and what we've been able to come across. And then depending on uh, the direction of county council, maybe seek further input from them on what might be appropriate at their own municipal table in, in, in uh, discussion with their, their own municipal councils in that regard. So I just wanna be clear, you are getting input for during, like specifically for this report. They're not, you're not just sharing it with them. Sure, through you, Mr. Warden. I guess it would depend on the direction from council here today. We have gotten input leading into this report. And if there was some direction that we are to move forward with consideration of delegation, then I think we'd seek input from, from our municipal staff in that regard, for sure. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Scott, for the report. It, as was noted, it was ironic that uh, the planning department is putting a report forward about efficiency. So it's, it's good to be uh, efficient. Um, just a comment, really, just quite frankly, I'm less interested in knowing whose eyeballs are getting paid to do these reports or do the, uh, the uh, planning consulting work uh, as how any of this is going to impact the applicants and the people seeking uh, the work. Uh, so I guess my question would be framed around less about who's doing the work as to how it's going to benefit. Uh, and, and how those efficiencies will benefit anyone requiring the work to be done. So I'm wondering, Scott, if you could just talk a little bit more about how this is going to benefit the ratepayers of Gray County. Please. <clears throat> so 
So through you, Mr. Warden, uh, great question, Councilor Milne. In some cases, it, 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 it may benefit, the ratepayers is a great county, and in some cases, it, it may benefit the developers of great county. Uh, one particular instance I can think of is, you know, if, if we're looking at a, a subdivision or condominium approval, uh, under the current process, quite often there would be a, a minimum of at least one, sometimes two staff reports at your own municipal table in that regard. Uh, so in some cases that might be to approve a zoning amendment, in other cases it might be to endorse uh, recommended conditions of draft plan approval that may then get sent up to the county. Uh, right now, the developer uh, is waiting uh, for that report, and then subsequently they're waiting for the similar staff report that comes to County Committee to hold. Um, so in theory, in, in not having to balance those, those two different councils' timeframes, there could be some time savings in that regard, for sure, and, and county staff would, would simply become a commenting body uh, through the development review process, similar to the Conservation Authority or the school boards or any, anyone else in that regard. Um, at this stage, we can't say for sure um, you know, how much time savings that would result in, but we could certainly look to uh, our friends at the City of Owen Sound who already have that delegated responsibility uh, to look at how efficiently their process works um, versus where we might be able to, to uh, learn from that in, in terms of um, um, applications where we, or, or processes where we've got dual approvals at the county and municipal level. I will say that I think some of the process efficiencies recommended in this report will have an impact on, on time savings for um, someone getting a yes at the end of the day in terms of a development approval. Um, but I can't say with any certainty just yet um, how much more quickly or not that would come uh, if it was, if it was uh, at the municipal level. And in some cases that might come down to the staffing resources and, and the volume of work uh, that your municipal staff and municipal councils are, are tasked with in that regard. Thank you, Councillor Silver. Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, certainly, I want to thank the planning staff for, for this very comprehensive report. Certainly, it opened my eyes quite a bit as to particularly the, the table on page four, where it talks about the resources that other municipalities have available, and as well as the Blue Mountains, in that um, you know we seem to have a lot of resources uh, relative to the others, but then when I considered the dollar value of building permits were probably under resourced. So, um, but then again, you know, there's, you can do anything with statistics, but it certainly seems like, um, you know, there, you know, I think we're in pretty good shape in the Blue Mountains. And, um, you know, the reason that the Blue Mountains requested this report um, stem back to the Gibraltar pit, uh, OPA 135 where we actually had to appeal a county decision um, on that uh, OPA 135 and um, then subsequently managed to negotiate with the proponent to come up with a solution that provided a buffer to the park, um, new trees and a much smaller pit than was would have been possible with the, the amendment. So, um, you know, I think there are times, and there are very few, I will admit, that the um, planning departments don't see eye to eye or, or councils don't see eye to eye. I guess in this case, it was at the transition of the council and the, the thing was really appealed initially um, because there was a lack of decision on the, on the, on the change of council. But um, then, you know, I think, you know, it is, you, you do need to have the resources to, to be able to take on these um, abilities. And I know that, you know, the Blue Mountains has six planners, but that doesn't include the, um, you know, professional engineer um, on the development engineering side and the technician and, and also the GIS and everything else. So, um, you know, there are quite a bit of resources needed, but I can also see the savings for the county and the town in that most um, plans of subdivision and condos go for zoning bylaw amendments. And so we are really looking at the same information with two reports and, you know, we are doing joint public meetings. So there is, you know, some good collaboration with the county and um, it, it does work out, but on the other hand, 
there is duplication of effort and particularly recently with the lower bay phase five um you know it's a lot of work <laughs> trust me you get you know and then we had delegations here at county council as well so i think there is some merit to this and you know as far as uh costs go um i think there will be savings um certainly having delegated authority seems to work for owen sound and i would point out that owen sound has about a quarter or a fifth of the development in terms of dollar value than does the town of blue mountain so um you know we do have some economies of scale in that we have a lot of units so I think it's worth pursuing to look at it. And if we can introduce some savings to county taxpayers, I think that would be great. Um, the one thing that was mentioned and perhaps we, we staff could pursue that with the province because the province has also identified that in their recent housing report is these open applications that never expire. Um, they're a thorn in our side in the Blue Mountains and, and, and I'm sure in the county as well. And, Perhaps a good way to deal with those would be to lobby the province to act on the recommendation in the housing report and just mandate that anything that's been open for more than 10 years and has an advance to uh, building permit stage just goes back to square one and uh, it doesn't just disappears because there's a huge amount of those on the books and I could see how any transfer of those files would be very problematic because we get them all the time, particularly in the last few years when, um, you know, all of a sudden there's a huge market for housing and somebody says, well, wait a minute, I have a planning application from 2008 on that property. Um, we'll just rejuvenate it. And then they say, do I need a new traffic study? And we go, well, uh, the traffic has changed, you know, so I think maybe this is an opportunity to lobby the province to say, please act on that recommendation and just sunset all those applications that have been open for more than 10 years. And, you know, if somebody wants to develop that piece of property, then they can start fresh. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, thank you for those comments, Councillor Swiver. Some some great suggestions there, and and certainly we chat further with with uh, the province with respect to uh, your comments about sunsetting applications. You know, we have learned from other municipalities that have taken steps to to uh, uh, as I said before, clean up some of those applications, and in some cases, uh, they were able to to uh, uh, close some of those files with with uh, um, not a lot of conflict. Uh, in other cases, it could result in appeals. So if there was something that could be done at the provincial level, uh, we could certainly look into that further. Uh, thank you also for your comments with respect to the potential for conflict between uh, county and municipal councils. Uh, with respect to that Gibraltar pit, um, yeah, that was an example whereby uh, county staff had brought a report forward to, to um, county council recommending approval. And, and we did so with the support of municipal staff um, who, who suggested it could go forward, um, but it hadn't been to your, your municipal council table yet to deal with the, the associated local official plan amendment and, and, uh, and, and zoning bylaw amendment in that regard. So yeah, there was that uh, conflict there. In that case, it was an official plan amendment, so it's not something we could consider delegating, but certainly your point is well taken that there are those instances where we can have uh, different points of view amongst councils and, or even amongst staff in that regard. So I appreciate you uh, raising some of those examples. Thank you, Councillor Mackey, you're next. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Uh, Scott and Randy, thanks very much. I, you know, reading through that report, you know, it gave a lot of time to think about what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. And from the comments that, you know, was really interesting reading through the comments, the vast majority spoke very highly of the competent professional um, service they get from our uh, county planning staff. So very much appreciate that. Um, you know, in reading through, there's sometimes, I'm glad to hear that there's program uh, efficiencies that you're looking at. So this wasn't a wasted exercise whatsoever. Anytime we can gain efficiencies, then it was worthwhile doing. But, you know, reading through, I can't help but think that the system's not broken right now. And why are we looking at changing a system that's not really broken? We've learned some lessons, so that's a great thing. But uh, I think there's check and balances. Duplication sometimes means check and balances. So. 
that's what I took from the report, but do appreciate, uh, you know, all the, uh, the work that our planning department does. And we don't always agree, but uh, that's okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I don't see any other hands and none on line either. Councillor Body has joined us. Um, so if that's the case, perhaps it's time to call the question. Councillor Mackey, you were not suggesting something other than uh, what the voting on the recommendation before us, correct? Right. Yeah. So yeah, so I'll just be uh, clarify perhaps. Uh, the motion before us is uh, to receive the report, to share it with the other member municipalities, and that any uh, municipality that's seeking a delegation planning approval uh, would submit um, a motion uh, from their council indicating that uh, request and that uh, should a request for delegation be received um, by county, that county staff would be directed to prepare a memorandum of understanding therein uh, containing the criteria that was uh, outlined in this uh, report. And that irregardless of everything that you see in the uh, preamble there, uh, staff will be directed to move forward uh, with further improvements uh, to this whole uh, planning process. Are we all clear? Uh, Councillor Mackey. So Mr. Warden, if we endorse this today, are we saying that should a member of municipality come forth that we would allow it to happen. I mean, if I don't believe that the system's broken, then I don't want to support something that changes the system. I'm maybe going to go to our clerk with this one. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, it does say that if a municipal council um, is interested in, in speaking further on this aspect with um, county planning staff, that a municipal resolution would be required from that council and then staff uh, both at the municipal and the county level would begin um, discussions but it, it that is only if your municipal council is interested in that process um, if you are happy with the status quo then that is that is how it will move forward um, on top of the efficiencies that our planning staff are, are um, interested in putting into place Sorry, I guess, Councillor Mackey, that's why I had asked, uh, based on your comments, I, I didn't know if you were proposing something else, but because uh, clearly if uh, a municipality is interested, they pass a resolution and then uh, county staff would be directed to pursue that. Madam CAO? I think it's important to, to uh, pay attention to point four in the resolution about um, the memorandum of understanding process that would come in as part of this, right? Like, even um, though we would re receive a request for that delegation, um, there's a whole process that would have to unfold at a staff level. Well, we come to terms with a mutual understanding about exactly what that means. We'll, I think, it's it fair to say, Scott, that we'll have some information that the member municipality staff wouldn't necessarily have full knowledge of or at their fingertips. Like, so for them to understand um, the totality of what they would be taking on, I think that's where some of that discussion um, would have to happen, right? So I can see this as, as a, one of your councils saying, we're, we're interested in exploring this. And then, so you're going to pass a resolution and what that's going to do is give your staff the support to enter into this additional piece of work that they wouldn't normally have in their work plan to then sit down and work it through with county staff to understand what all the pieces are, what this would mean, what how many um, applications are currently in play, all the different pieces about fees that have been paid, et cetera, et cetera, to work through all of that. And then at the end, now you've now as staff, we've got kind of a mutual understanding. I think that would need to go back to your council then. Your staff would need to talk to your council about what does this mean and are we still good? And if we're going to do this, it's going to take additional resources or it's not. All of that would need to be explored. And then you guys, your own councils would make a decision. About, uh, about what you needed. And then I think it would come back to us after you made sure within your own 
municipality that you saw this as a, as a great benefit for yourselves. Have I got that right, Brandy and Scott? Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's that's roughly how we see the process unfolding. Uh, obviously, you know, it's it's a bit of work to get to that stage. Then and then, uh, but if a if a municipal council was interested in having those approvals delegated, they could pass that motion. We would go through that exercise, like Kim indicated, and ultimately prepare a draft memorandum of understanding and a bylaw back to this council for consideration. Um, if what I'm hearing though is if some councillors are, are indicating that status, they would prefer status quo, I guess we'd be looking for direction from county council at this stage because that is a lot of work for both county staff and municipal staff to work through that process to get to the MOU stage. And I would hate to, I guess, have that all those that time spent if at the end of the day, county council won't be uh, supportive of passing an MOU and a bylaw to delegate approval. So, so I guess I, I'd be looking back to County Council for some further clarification direction on, on before we go down that road and that path that Kim outlined. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Well, I'd certainly like that answer too. So I'm certainly willing to put forth a motion that we continue status quo. All right, so what I'm hearing is um, you would likely have to vote on this and defeat it. If it's defeated, then you can propose an alternate or you can propose no alternate, with, which ultimately means status quo. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I just, I just want to be clear that I understand what um, the CAO said. Um, the only thing that bothers me about this is this, this is being shared with our municipality. And, and if our staff are not satisfied with that, you're not gonna come back and say, well, you, you voted for it, you received it. Um, so there's no changes to be made. The way I understand what you're saying is there can be changes later if, if our staff don't approve. Do, do I understand that right? Like, I just don't want, like when I see, when I see that you're sharing the report with, with our staff, um, and then I vote for this, and my staff says like, this is no good. This, we have to make, you have to make changes. And I come back and you say it's too late, then I, I'm gonna vote no to this now. So I just, just make sure I understand this correctly, please. I think you've been sorry. You've been clear in the in the report about what the county has the authority to delegate, and there are things that we don't have the authority to delegate. So we're not able to have a conversation about those things. Though so the report the report outlines the things that could be delegated, and it lays out a process for a municipality to negotiate or understand what that means for them to have those processes delegated and how that decision will be made. Um, I don't, if I'm trying to think in what instance, like this, the, everybody's member planning staff have been engaged in, in this work up till now and are aware of it. So I, I hope that there's a very low risk that, that there's going to be people in your ministerial own staff that are going to come back and say, this, this can't, this is incorrect or, or, or this can't, can't be. Because I think we've tried to do our due diligence as best we can to ensure that that's not some, uh, not a position that we're putting you in. In this case, just to, to build on what Kim was saying there, we have shared this report um, when it went out to council with municipal planning staff and municipal staff in that regard, just as a courtesy. We, of course, told them that has no level of endorsement from council yet, but it is a, a public report that's posted on our website, so we didn't want anyone to be caught off guard there. 
Um, but typically, if council were to support a motion like this, or sorry, committee of the whole were to support a motion like this, we'd, we'd send them a further update to say that that report we sent you a week ago has now been dealt with by committee of the whole and they said X kind of thing. Um, so they, they are aware. I won't say that that we've gone through and, and gotten, you know, endorsement from every municipal staff person by any means, but they've been engaged throughout this process and, and uh, uh, they were emailed a copy of this report when it went public with, with council. Okay, Councilor Carlton, I see you and I will acknowledge you uh, shortly. Uh, the gist that I'm hearing from uh, this report is this. There, the report is saying there are certain items that can be delegated. And if a municipality chose to have that delegated, uh, they would indicate that by passing a resolution at their own council. The resolution would then come to county and county would then respond by engaging a process for a memorandum of understanding. So that's essentially what I uh, think I read in this report. If I'm wrong about that, then somebody correct me. Uh, and with that said, I'll go next to Councillor Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And you just said exactly what I was somewhat questioning, that if this goes back to each municipal council and each council decides they don't want to um, move ahead, they're happy with the status quo, that they're allowed to do that, but that if they want to make changes, they can. So I just want clarity on that. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. Yes, Councillor Carlton, that's that's exactly how we see it. Uh, the only other piece to the report was the process efficiencies and, and uh, county staff are seeking the blessing of council, regardless of where we go with the delegation opportunity uh, to proceed with process efficiencies. Um, but based on the survey results and based on past discussions with municipal staff, it's been clear to us that, that some do want it and some don't. Uh, so if, if council supported the motion as is, and a municipal council were to say, we'd like to move forward with, with further discussions on that MOU, then, then each uh, uh, municipal and county staff person would be authorized to start that process, which as Randy said, is, is a fair bit of work. And similarly, if a municipal council or staff said, nope, we're not interested in this, uh, then there'd be no further discussions with that particular municipality other than on the topic of, of process efficiencies. Council Carlton, you're good. Yes. All right, I don't see any other hands, so perhaps it's time. Everybody understands what we're voting on now. So it's time to call the question. All those in favor of the motion before you, please raise your hand. The motion is passed. Thank you very much, Scott, Randy, a lot of work here, and a lot of work to come. <laughs> okay, so we are now going to go back and uh, deal with item 5C, the tender uh, results uh, for Gray Road uh, 13 uh, rehabilitation. Um, I believe it was Councillor Bordignon. Would you like to move that, sir? Yes, thank you. Okay. And I need a seconder. Oh, Councillor Soever. Okay, Councillor Bordignon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Warden. Very quickly, um, I just want to confirm with staff um, that we're doing a, a 1.5 meter paved shoulders just for the cycling in our, our town. We have a lot of, um, you know, throughout the county, but especially in the town of Blue Mountains. Um, and I had questions that make sure that we are doing the 1.5 uh, meter paved shoulders. And if they are doing a shave and pave along that section of 13, and if the gravel shoulder will receive a tarring treatment. Those are the three questions posed to, uh, posed to me that I thought I'd bring to, to county staff. Huh? Thank you, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, we are completing uh, 1.5 meter paved shoulders throughout the uh, project. Um, the, middle, the middle section is, uh, I guess just for some quick background, um, so the sections north of 40 and south of Slabtown need a full pulverize and paved. But our, our thinking was the section in the middle from Greyhound 40 to, to Slabtown, it's actually in quite good shape. So we didn't want to pulverize it because the asphalt that's there is good. Um, so it's being an overlay with the paved shoulders. We didn't want to leave kind of a little orphan section 
where there's no paved shoulders when there's stuff north and south. So um, even though we're not pulverizing the middle, we are overlaying it with fully paved shoulders. Um, the granular ceiling, uh, typically we have been doing that. Um, this area is quite flat, so I'll have to get you the details of the exact contract. Typically we do that uh, granular ceiling uh, black on the edge to kind of hold the, the portion of the, uh, the gravel shoulder. But I, I will confirm that, that uh, it's in this job. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're getting there. We're on to item number uh, seven now. 7A is about the Ontario Good Roads Association delegation request. Uh, Madam CAO, I think I'm turning that over to you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. So uh, the county has, has not often done uh, delegations at OGRA, but we did wanna bring forward that uh, opportunity to you if, if there was anything that anybody felt uh, strongly that they wanted to uh, meet with the minister about. I have heard from um, our colleagues in Bruce County that there is um, some discussion there with between ourselves, and Bruce and Huron, uh, asking for a delegation to deal with uh, transit and the coordination their extension of, of transit in rural communities. So um, if that does go ahead as a, as a multi-county delegation, would you be supportive of that? Um, and at this point, that's, uh, that's the only delegation that I'm aware of at this time. We had an original discussion of a potential one to do with, uh, with Highway 26, but I understand that um, there's been a great deal of very positive work happened recently with MTO and uh, county staff and staff at Town of the Blue Mountains. So probably not necessary to, uh, to say anything more about that since it seems to be moving along really well at this time. So I guess I was looking to know if there, if there was anything else that anyone felt that we should be bringing forward as a delegation or in a, just a general sense, if anybody objected, should Bruce and Huron decide that they want to proceed with the transit discussion? Or does anybody have any objection to us participating in that? Right. I see no hands, so I think you can take your direction from that. Would be endorsing not. I think not. Yeah. No, I don't have confirmation from them yet that they're going to meet us. Right. Thank you. Okay, so we're on to item number uh, eight now. Are there any notices of motion, uh, Councillor Soever? Yes, um, Mr. Warden, I'd like to bring a notice that I intend to bring in a motion um, with regards to the supplementaries. And because as you know, we all know that uh, it's to the benefit of Gray County that all of the lower tiers who work with MPAC work diligently with MPAC to capture all the assessment and we're seeing a lot of growth. And so I intend to bring a motion to incentivize these lower tiers so that in any year in which a lower tier delivers more than its budgeted amount of supplementary taxation as projected in the county budget, such ex excess uh, revenue shall be contributed by the county to that lower tier community's community improvement plan. And community improvement plans, of course, uh, work to improve our communities and benefit all of Gray County. So this is just a way of uh, making sure that those communities that work hard and find all the assessment that is attached to their growth that um, they, they will benefit through their community improvement plan, which of course that benefits all of Gray County. Yes, sir, any other uh, notices of motion? Seeing none, uh, we will be heading towards uh, adjournment, but before we do, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that while we've been sitting, um, there have been significant developments internationally. Um, and even right now, um, there's been significant advancement in terms of Russia's attack on the Ukraine from multiple uh, directions. 
so I, I wonder if you would just um, perhaps join me in, in just taking a moment of silence uh, so that we can uh, just give our thoughts to world peace. Just a few seconds, please. Thank you very much. Before we adjourn, uh, I want to thank uh, Rob and Olivia at the back there. <laughs> you pulled it off. It was excellent. Uh, I know that a lot of work goes, in, goes into uh, preparing for something like this. Uh, Hanover struggled on uh, Tuesday night to get it done. And you folks, uh, there were no hitches here. This worked beautifully. So testament to the preparation and the work that you've put in there. Thank you so much. All right. Council, we're ready for a motion to adjourn. So I'm looking for a mover, Councillor Burley, of course, <laughs> seconded by Councillor uh, Desai. All those in favor? No one being opposed. That's carried. Thank you so much, folks. Have a great day and a great weekend. <laughs>